agenda. Is there this, the agenda was sent out prior to the meeting? Is there a motion to adopt? Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion on the agenda? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Nays, nays oppose. All right. The agenda is adopted. We are on item C, the approval of the January 12th, 2023 minutes, and those were sent out, commissioners, to you prior to the meeting as well. And is there a motion to adopt the minutes? There's a motion. Second. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. Those no. Ayes have it. And the minutes are adopted. Now we're on to the recognition of the council members. And um, we just, we try to take every council member um, when we see y'all come in, in order. So first I saw uh, council member Stiles. Do you want to go first or you want to wait for your item or? My item is deferred. Well, we really appreciate you coming down. Nice to see you. <laughs> Thank you, council lady. We appreciate it. Council member Toombs, you want to come on up? Welcome, and I think you got to, you know, you got to push the button. Welcome. Thank you, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I just have a couple of items. Um, I think most things are on uh, are being deferred, but I have um, no, item number twenty nine, the twenty six nineteen Old Buena Vista Road. I want to speak in support of that. Um, application. I have not had an opportunity to have a community meeting yet, but uh, this opens up a very important um, discussion for Old Buena Vista Road. Um, I've read the staff report uh, concerning infrastructure on Old Buena Vista Road. It is a very tiny two-lane road, and I've been piecing together projects to, to bring some infrastructure improvement to that area. So I, I'm fine with it moving past the commission, and then I'll have that um, community meeting uh, once it's in my court. Um, with seeking council approval. Uh, also, 32 is 1210 Katy Avenue, um, going from RS5 to R6. A community meeting was held for that and there wasn't any opposition, so I'm in support of that as well. Um, normally these items don't get put on my council list, but number 40, um, which is a final plat approval that doesn't even come to council, but interested in hearing the discussion uh, about that um, later on in your agenda. And I have had a couple of constituents reach out to me about item number 35, which is, um, looks like it's getting rid of a portion of a PUD. And I know there's some concern about a cemetery that's in that area. And um, that is something, an issue that is um, important to me because I have several cemeteries and burial grounds in my district where there are four enslaved um, individuals buried there. And I know that's a concern with this particular location. So I'd ask that you take that into consideration. I'm not as familiar with this side since this is not something that's going to come before council, but if there's something that can be worked out to preserve that um, historic piece of, of land where there are enslaved bodies, um, that would be very much appreciated. And that's all I am. Thank you, council lady. Pleasure to see you. Any other didn't see any other council members. And just a, a few reminders, everybody, a few housekeeping items. If you could make sure you silent your phone so we can have a productive meeting. And then commissioners, as you know, the microphones are real sensitive. So push the button slowly uh, so we don't, otherwise we'll have to get um, the staff over to reset the system. So just, just a few housekeeping reminders, right, Vice Chair? We, that's right. Buttons are the problem. Um, seeing no other council members, uh, we're on item E, items for deferral withdrawal. And Lisa, I believe you're going to take us through that. Okay. The following items are for deferral or withdrawal, starting on page three of your agenda, item number one, 2022Z014TX001, text amendment related to trees. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 23rd Planning Commission meeting. Item number two, 2017SP034003, Broadmoor and Ben Allen amendment. Staff recommendation is to defer to the March 9th meeting. On page four of your agenda, item number three, 2018 SP026009, the reservoir amendment. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 23rd meeting. Item number four, 2022 SP036001, Harpeth Reserve. 
staff recommendation is to defer to the February 23rd meeting. Item number five, 2022 SP 071001 Liberty Lane. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 23rd meeting. Item number six, 2022 SP 079001 717 Spence Lane SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 23rd meeting. On page five of your agenda, item number 7A, 2023 SP 012001 Samuels Peak. Staff recommendation is to defer to the March 9th meeting. The associated case 7B, 1886P001, River Traces State's cancellation. Staff recommendation is to defer to the March 9th planning commission meeting. Item number eight, 2022Z140PR001, a rezoning on Misty Cape Cove. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. Item number nine, 2023Z010PR001, staff recommendation, a rezoning on Alberta Street. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 23rd meeting. Item number 10, 2023Z018PR001, a rezoning on Clarksville Pike. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 23rd meeting. On page six of your agenda, item number 11, 2022S221001, Hawks Haven. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 8th Planning Commission meeting. Item number 12, 2022S. 232001 King Subdivision. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 23rd meeting. Item number 13, 2022S259001, resub of lot two of the plan of Rural Hill Acres. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 23rd meeting. Item number 14, 2022S264001, 5713 through 5715 Maldina Avenue. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 23rd meeting. Item number 15, 2023S. 010001 Tenon Subdivision. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 23rd meeting. On page seven of your agenda, item number 1688P038001, Long Hunter Chase Amendment. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 23rd meeting. Item number 17A, 2022CP005001, East Nashville Community Plan Amendment and the Associated Case 17B, 2022SP031001, Porter and Cajal. Staff recommendation is to defer both items to the February 23rd meeting. On page eight of your agenda, item number 19, 2019 SP 014003, Goodrich Townhomes Amendment. A staff recommendation is deferred to the February 23rd meeting. On page nine of your agenda, item number 27, 2023Z001PR001, a rezoning on Luton Street. Staff recommendation is deferred to the March 9th meeting. On page 10 of your agenda, item number 30, 2023Z008PR001, a rezoning on Brit Church Pike. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 23rd meeting. On page 11 of your agenda, item number 23, I'm sorry, 34, uh, 2023Z017PR001, a rezoning on Abbott Martin Road. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 23rd meeting. On page 12 of your agenda, item number 41, 2023S016001, 840 Old Lebanon Dirt Road. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 23rd meeting. And on page 13 of your agenda, item number 44, 2023DTC005001601, Lafayette. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 23rd meeting. Thank you, Lisa. And so, commissioners, you've heard the items for deferral withdrawal, but we'll go through these and at least to make sure we get these correct. So the items for deferral withdraw are items one, two, three, four, five, six, seven A, seven B, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen A, seventeen B, nineteen, twenty seven, thirty, thirty four, forty one, and forty four. Is that correct? Yes. All right, commissioners, you've heard the items for deferral withdrawal. Is there a motion? There's a motion second. and a second. Any discussion? <clears throat> Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Those no, ayes have it, and those items are deferred. And so now, Lisa, we are on to the consent agenda, item F. Items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience 
or the commission request that the item be removed from the consent agenda. I will now read through the item numbers and the name, project name of the items that are on tentative consent. If there is anyone in the audience that is in opposition to the item, please raise your hand. If there's opposition in, um, in attendance, then the item will be heard in the order on which it appears on the agenda. Uh, item number 20, 2022 SP046001, Walton Trace. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 20? What, did somebody raise their hand or were they just? It, okay, there was a waving. Um, item number 21, 2022 SP0800014048, Woodland Street. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 21? 21 will be on consent. Item number 22, 2022 SP 084001, 5646 Amelie Drive. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 22? Okay, 22 will be presented. Item number 23, 2022 SP 087001, 6010 Pasco Road. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 23? 23 will be on consent. Item number 24, 2023 SP 003001, 630 Division Street. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 24? 24 will be on consent. Item number 25, 2023 SP 009001, 5901 California SP. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 25? 25 will be on consent. Item number 26, 2023 SP, 2023 SP 013001, 253 Nesbitt Lane. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 26? 26 will be presented. On page 10 of your agenda, item number 29, 2023Z004PR001, a rezoning on Old Buena Vista Road. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 29? 29 will be on consent. Item number 31, 2023Z013PR001, rezoning on Wheeler Avenue. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 31? Okay, 31 will be presented. Item number 32, 2023Z014PR001, a rezoning request on Katy Avenue. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 32? 32 will be on consent. Item number 33, 2023Z016PR001, a rezoning on 33rd Avenue North. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 33? 33 will be on consent. Item number 35, 188-84P005, Century South I-24. Is there anyone in, in opposition to item number 35? 35 will be presented. Item number 36, 2021S-183-001, resubdivision of part of lot 40 plan of Clifton. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 36? 36 will be on consent. Item number 37, 2022S-079-002, Williamson Homestead. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 37? Yes. And I don't know what the conditions are you have to Um Can... Will you go talk to the uh, our staff team over there? Yeah, go, go over there and talk to them. Thank you. No, it's good. We want to make sure everybody's comfortable. Not, okay. a, Logan, not a problem. Give me a, sen a signal on that one. I'm going to keep... Yeah, it. we'll make sure we don't go forward until we get it resolved. Item number 38, 2022S-247-001, Millie Sweeney and Kirk M. Sweeney. Uh, Platt, is there anyone in opposition to item number 38? 38 will be on consent. Item number 39, 2023S-007001, Monte Carlo Estates. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 39? 39, 39 will be on consent. Item number 42, 2023S-019001, Gary Greer Farms. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 42? 42 will be on consent. Item number 43, 2023S-022001, 117 East Campbell Road. Is there anyone in opposition to item 43? 43 will be on consent. Okay. Um, here, 28. 28, because it's a recommendation of disapproval, it's automatically presented. Okay, uh, 
uh, Chair, I'm going to go through and read the captions of the items that are on consent. Yes. Thank you, Lisa. As information for our audience, if you are not satisfied with a decision made by the Planning Commission today, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of cert with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the entry of the Planning Commission's decision. To ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met, please be advised that you should contact independent legal counsel. The following items are on the consent agenda. On page eight of your agenda, item number 20, 2022 SP 046001, Walton Station. It's a request to rezone from RS10 to SP for property located on Walton Lane to permit 175 residential units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 21, 2022 SP 080001, 408 Woodland Street. It's a request to rezone from CS to SP for property located on Woodland Street to permit a hotel. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. On page nine of your agenda, item number 23, 2022 SP 0870016010 Pasco Road. It's a request to rezone from AR 2A to SP for property located on Pasco Road to permit 20 multifamily units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 24, 2023 SP 003001 630 Division Street. It's a request to rezone from DTC to SP for a property located at 630 Division Street to permit a mixed-use development. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 25, 2023 SP 009001, 5901 California SP. It's a request to rezone from IR to SP for a property located at 5901 California Avenue to permit a mixed-use development. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. On page 10 of your agenda, item number 29, 2023Z, 004PR, 001. It's a request to rezone from RS10 to R10 for property located on Old Buena Vista Road. Staff recommendation is to approve R10 with conditions. Item number 32, 2023Z, 014PR, 001. It's a request to rezone from RS5 to R6 for a property located on Katy Avenue. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 33, 2023Z016PR001. It's a request to rezone from RS5 to R6A for a property located on 33rd Avenue North. Staff recommendation is to approve. On page 11 of your agenda, item number 36, 2021S, 183-001, resubdivision of part of lot 40 plan of Clifton. It's a request for final plot approval to create three lots on property located on 39th Avenue North. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. I'm going to hold on 37. Item 38, 2022S, 247-001, Millie Sweeney and Kirk M. Sweeney. It's a request for final plat approval to create two lots on property located at 3525 Old Clarksville Pike. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions, including an exception from section 342D to allow a flag lot. On page number 12, on, on page 12, number 39, 2023S007001, Monte Carlo Estates. It's a request for concept plan approval to create two lots for property located on Monte Carlo Court. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Item number 42, 2023S019001, Geary Greer Farms. It's a request for final plat approval to shift lot lines and create one lot on properties located on Greer Road. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and exceptions to 4251B for lot 8 and exceptions to 425 for lot 10. Item number 43, 2023S, 022001, 117 East Campbell Road. It's a request for final plat approval to create four lots on property located on East Campbell Road. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. 
On page 13, under other business, item number 45, an employment contract renewal for Deborah Sullivan. Item number 46, a new, new employment contract for Selena Koningstein. And item number 50, to approve the director's report. Thank you, Lisa. And so we'll go through these slowly and make sure that we have them all, commissioners. And so the items for passing all at once on the consent agenda are items number 20, 21, 23, 24, 25, 29, 32, 33, 36, and then what have, I forgot about 37. Are we? Um, I'm sorry. You start back. They were giving me that date. I'm 37 and I missed it. Okay. Well, hold on, ma'am. Uh, hold on one second. 37 will be presented? Yes. Okay. 37 will not be on the consent agenda. It will be presented. All right. So we'll start over. It's fine, Lisa. We, we want to make sure we get all these correct. There's a lot of them. So... All right, commissioners, the items on the consent agenda that will be passed all at one time will be items number 20, 21, 23, 24, 25, 29, 32, 33, 36, 38, 39, 42, 43, 45, 46, and 50. That's correct. All right, commissioners, you've heard the items. Is there a motion? There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and the items are adopted. So that leaves us with eight items to consider tonight. And those items will be 18, 22, 26, 28, 31, 35. 37 and 40. So we'll give everybody just a second to clear out the room and then we'll start on item 18. And just a reminder, I heard a few cell phones out there. Let's try to put them on silent. I appreciate it. Are you ready? Almost. Maybe. Oh, we're not quite ready. Okay. I'm forcing it today. I apologize. Do you want me to fix it? Oh, yes. So, you know, we we need to get this, the screens just went out, so we're experiencing a little bit of technical difficulty, but just give us a moment. We'll get it back up and running.
All right, we're ready to go, I think. Millie, you ready? Go ahead. I am ready. Okay. Item 18 tonight. My name is Amelia Lewis, and I will be presenting this item, which is the McGavick House SP Amendment. Uh, the request is an SP amendment to permit an increase in the number of hotel rooms permitted and permit the construction of a new hotel. Staff's recommendation is to disapprove as submitted or defer to the March 9th meeting to work with staff to bring the development closer to the supplemental policy. Um, so the existing zoning on the site is SP. Um, the SP uh, is located at the northeast and northwest corners of Cleveland Street and Meridian Street and includes additional properties to the north along Meridian Street and along Vaughn Street. Um, the SP is a total of 3.23 acres. Um, the original SP was intended to function as a holistic development with the property sharing uses and parking across the entirety of the SP. Um, the focused amendment area is within subdistrict B, um, but given the original intent of the SP to provide uses across the entire SP, staff had this um, proposed amendment processed as an amendment to the entirety of the SP. Um, the staff report kind of goes through the history of the subdistricts on the site, um, but for the sake of the presentation, um, we'll just focus on the proposed changes to subdistrict B, um, is that where as that is where the proposed changes are. Um, Subdistrict B is comprised of four existing parcels at the northeast corner of the intersection of Cleveland Street and Meridian Street. Uh, there is an existing structure on the site which was previously used as a religious institution. The existing structure is eligible to be listed in the National Register. The uses for Subdistrict B within the original approved preliminary SP included up to 50 multifamily dwelling units, restaurant, bed and breakfast, hotel, community education, office, retail. The hotel use was limited to one hotel with a maximum of 35 rooms. And an additional condition stated that any development on the site in Subdistrict B was required to be within the existing building on the site. Um, the breadth of uses that was permitted um, was to provide for flexibility in the adaptive reuse of the existing structure on the site. Um, so the proposed amendment, um, the site plan is shown on the screen above. The proposed amendment would increase the number of permitted hotel rooms to 89 and permit the construction of a new hotel structure adjacent to the existing structure on the site. Um, so you see kind of the outline of the existing uh, structure on the site, which is at the corner of Meridian and Cleveland Street um, in the footprint of the new structure uh, located to the east of that or on the right side of the screen. Um, north of the existing structure is a proposed pool and surface parking area. The existing structure would be modified to include a mix of uses, including restaurant and hotel. The proposed new structure is four stories with first floor retail space as well as structured parking. The second through fourth floors would be hotel uses. A vehicular entrance is located east of the existing structure, um, in addition to an existing alley network at the rear of the property to provide additional vehicular access. Um, and so now we're gonna go through some of the um, proposed renderings. Um, so this is the view along Cleveland Street. Um, you can see the existing structure with the brick facade um, and the proposed new structure located adjacent to that. Um, this is the view looking at um, if you were at the corner of Cleveland and Meridian. Um, so you start to see that uh, the existing structure um, with the primary entrance to the hotel, um, the courtyard that's in between um, the existing building and uh, Cleveland Street as well um, with the proposed addition kind of at the rear of the site there. Um, next, um, on top is a zoomed out kind of pulled back angle again from Cleveland Street showing the full width of the um, existing structure as well as the proposed structure. Um, so again, the proposed structure would be uh, four stories um, with that lower level um, and three stories above, um, coming out to about 48 feet in height. 
Um, below is kind of um, an aerial view of that um, facade along Cleveland Street. So you see a little bit of the existing structure um, on the left side and the proposed uh, structure to the right. And this is the last one. So this is just a closer view, um, looking at the proposed structure with that small retail building um, off of the street um, and the proposed hotel uses above. Um, so the policy is T4 Urban urban neighborhood center, which is intended to do uh, kind of what uh, it says in the name, um, which is providing a neighborhood center, um, neighborhood uses, um, and a development at a scale that's compatible to the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, however, the site is also located within a supplemental policy um, and the supplemental policy um, is really intended to provide kind of that more specific nuanced guidance for this specific area. Um, and so that specific area is shown on the screen. Um, it is, it does correspond with the boundaries of the SP as well. So those are the same. Um, the supplemental policy was um, adapted specifically to guide the guidance of this or hmm, to guide the development of this SP um, when the SP was uh, going through at the same time, kind of in tandem uh, with Nashville Next. Um, so the bulk of staff's analysis really focused on the supplemental policy guidance. Um, and I've pulled out some of the key points here. Um, and I'll, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, so the proposed amendment uh, does meet um, one of the major goals of the supplemental policy, which is to renovate and preserve the existing structure on the site, um, which is also a critical goal to staff. However, staff has several concerns with the proposed intensity of the development um, that conflicts with the supplemental policy guidance points above, um, especially related to the height and the scale of the proposed new structure. Um, the easternmost parcels in the site where the new structure would be constructed are immediately adjacent to a single family residential uses and within a residential policy. Based on the guidance in the supplemental policy, the proposed new structure should be limited to smaller scale uses, limited in height to two stories, um, one adjacent to residential policies, um, and should provide additional landscape buffering and increased distance between the structures. Um, ultimately, to provide a transition between the existing structure, the new structure, and then the surrounding residential development. The intent of the original SP was primarily to renovate and rehabilitate the existing structure on the site while opening up opportunities for new uses such as hotel or restaurant space. The supplemental policy was specifically crafted for this development and the two were approved simultaneously. The proposed site plan does make improvements that weren't originally a part of the preliminary SP, um, including enhancing um, the plaza area located between the existing building and the uh, public rights of way, um, whereas these areas were previously envisioned to be surface parking. Um, this is much more engaging and friendly towards the public realm at the intersection and along the street frontage. Staff's recommendation to disapprove the plan is currently proposed or defer with changes that will bring the plan closer to the guidance in the supplemental policy indicates that staff may be able to support some level of changes to the site, but not as currently proposed. Um, staff has provided additional guidance on some changes that could bring the um, request closer to the guidance in the supplemental policy. Um, Given the conflicts with the supplemental policy, uh, staff's recommendation is to disapprove as submitted or defer um, in order to work with staff to bring the development closer to the supplemental policy guidance. Thank you, Million. We'll open this item for public hearing. And is the applicant in the, in the room? Got it. 
Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chip Howarth with Adapt Development. I'm here in partnership with the applicant and vent communities um, on this SP amendment. Uh, first off, I want to thank y'all for your service to Nashville here today. Y'all are at the front of a lot of very big decisions that happened in Nashville and uh, see a lot of change. So thank you for your service to the city of Nashville. I also want to thank staff. I think you probably, you've heard a lot of these presentations, so you've probably gathered there's a lot of back and forth with staff on this one. Um, Amelia was great to work with throughout the process. They were, we're at a result that we don't like right now. Uh, it's not because of the process or Amelia's efforts to work with us. Um, so we're very thankful for her. Um, we're thankful for the time she invested in the project to come out and meet with us on site to tour it. Um, we also are appreciative of historic staff, historic's willingness to do the same, um, as well as uh, presidents of both McFerrin Park and Cleveland Park Neighborhood Association and uh, Council Member Parker. So thankful for everyone who showed an interest in the project um, and wanted to see how, what we're doing and, and how we would proceed. Um, a little background on the property. Amelia gave a pretty great synopsis of it. Um, the sanctuary that you're looking at above was built in 1936, the academic wing in 1925. Um, they have been vacant since 2016. Um, my partner, one of my partners, Jamie Pfeffer, uh, heard in 2021 that this property, while for sale, someone was looking at it, whether this is true or not, was looking at this building and was contemplating tearing down part or all of the church. Jamie would tell you had an emotional reaction to that, thought that was a terrible result for the neighborhood and the community, and uh, went forward and moved forward with this without much of a plan, just because he felt that that church was so important to this property. Um, as it has laid vacant since 2016, um, that vacancy has just exacerbated the deferred maintenance on the church and led to further deterioration that just happens when buildings sit vacant. Um, so we feel it incredibly important to help not reinvent the church because the building is just fantastic, but to do what we can to make sure that there's a development that can happen on the site that incorporates the church into the community as part of the community. Um, the issue, as Amelia noted very clearly, is we have a conflict with the supplemental policy. Um, supplemental policy uh, tracked along with the McGavick House SP to, in 2017, which in Nashville six years ago, almost six years ago, was a lifetime ago. Um, understand the, the goals of the policy in 2017 were to manage the transition between the neighborhood center areas into the uh, neighborhood evolving areas. Uh, 309 Cleveland, which is the... Uh, eastern side of the new proposed hotel is the edge of that neighborhood center policy. 311 Cleveland is the beginning edge of that neighborhood evolving policy. Um, so how we arrived at our height is we took a step back and kind of looked from the street at the building itself. Um, we showed, Amelia showed it, and there's another good example of it on page 11 um, of the packet that was just handed out, the bottom image there. Uh, we took the church it steps down the academic wing, it steps down to the sanctuary going west, and then we started stepping down the new hotel going to the east. Um, looking at what's allowable on 311 Cleveland, which is in that neighborhood policy of three stories, you know, we determined we stepped back off of that, um, that uh, allowance for that uh, 311 Cleveland and believe that we are integrating into the community very well with our heights of our building. Um, I, again, about the, a little bit about the process, you know, Jamie, as part of Invent, bought this property in, in 2021. And I, I think it shows by the fact that we're here really for the first time is that, that we took our time on this. We want to get it right. Um, we had, I've been to six neighborhood meetings. I know Jamie's been to more. You know, really want to work with the neighborhood on what made sense at this spot, both McFerrin Park and Cleveland Park. Um, originally, we proposed a concept that they didn't really like that much. And that led to some pretty dramatic changes in what our program was, which we think resulted in an improvement of the current, current program. Uh, we worked with Historic on this um, at the recommendation of, of staff about uh, getting some ideas from them. And they had some great ideas, which we incorporated in to both the new building in particular, uh, really liking the transition from old to new to kind of show off the historic nature of the church, um, thinking about how to address the parking so it doesn't look like the building's floating. They had some great suggestions, which we've incorporated in, which we think made the project better. And again, we had some great collaboration with Amelia and her team. Um, she made some great suggestions over the course of, of this. Uh, the front piece was just parking. 
at a planning staff's suggestion, they said, let's think of a different way to activate this corner. And so we came up with that with that garden concept, which we think is a, is a great benefit to the neighborhood. Um, we had an elevator um, shaft that was up front. Uh, planning staff's recommendation, we've, we've moved that. And then again, it's just a much cleaner look for the building. It really shows off, off the building. And then continuing to take both community and um, staff concern about parking into account. You know, though there's recent parking legislation would move the re requirement for parking here, we've got structured parking to address that need within the neighborhood. Um, so we took our time on this. We worked with the neighborhoods, understand where everybody is, but we think that this ends up being a good result. Um, the conflict, again, is about the height of the proposed new building and the what's allowable in the supplemental policy, which is to generally limit um, buildings to two stories adjacent on properties adjacent to neighborhood policy or, or residential policy. Um, the SP, the supplemental plan policy, yeah, I guess taking a step back, a lot of people have looked at this. You know, there's some really, really high aspirations for this in 2016, um, of what could happen on this church and on this property. And a lot of people have looked at it. Um, I, no one's cracked the code yet. And we believe that no one's been able to crack that code because of the limitations in the supplemental policy. Um, we believe that those documents, while guidance for how Nashville grows, are living documents. And we think that we're in a place six years later, nearly six years later, um, where it may make sense to reevaluate what that supplemental policy calls for. Um, and we think this will be a great development for the neighborhood because it will be truly part of the neighborhood. Um, so I'm going to hold back some of my time if needed. I think I get to hold back two minutes. Um, and I want to thank you all again for all your work on this. Um, thanks for your consideration and uh, appre would appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll reserve two minutes for rebuttal. Anyone wishing to speak in support? Come on up. And please state your name. Sure. My name is Jamie Pfeffer. I'm here on path of ownership and just appreciate the time and consideration. I've been very involved in the neighborhood for, for many years, part of the team behind uh, Folk, Roxy, Redheaded Stranger, Audrey, a number of other projects. And so we've just been trying to uh, support the project, appreciate the opportunity, want to kind of say hi and welcome any questions. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? Good afternoon, Planning Commission. Patrick Napier, 2002 Richard Jones Road. Um, I'm here representing uh, former Lucas, uh, the civil uh, engineering firm, um, working with uh, Chip and Jamie on the project. So a few things I would like to note. Um, this plan did go before Historic Zoning Commission and received a recommendation of approval, passed on consent without opposition. Um, we have an approved TIS, um, so we are providing adequate parking, adequate access. So. We took that into account through a lot of the neighborhood meetings that we um, we took to the community. Um, we wanted to make sure that we weren't putting an undue burden um, since we are in an urban setting. Um, so we do have more than enough adequate parking to meet all of the uses on site. Um, as Chip previously cited, um, our policy documents are living documents. Often they're amended. Um, and if you may be wondering why we didn't choose to amend the supplemental policy, um, we felt that given the scope of the work that staff is currently doing, um, that this may be a better forum to discuss supplemental policy rather than um, requesting staff resources to zero in and just one project for an amendment. Um, so that being said, I would also like to mention that we know that the supplemental policy talks about transitions to residential properties adjacent to this site. So while we do have um, properties to the east along Cleveland, but our zone, I believe RS5, um, a handful of those are worthy of conservation des designated by historic. Those properties are not historically protected. They could redevelop today and achieve a height almost as tall as what we're proposing on the adjacent property line to the east. So while we understand the supplemental policy wants to transition, if the properties, if those properties were to redevelop, we may lose what the supplemental policy aimed to aim to protect. Um, so in closing, um, we thank the commission for their service and the staff for their work on the project. Thank you. Anyone else? Welcome. Uh, Samuel Boyd. Um, I'm actually from the neighborhood. 
actually went to the church. Just your yeah, name and address. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, Joseph, Joseph Avenue, 316. Okay. But um, I've actually been by and seen and talked to these guys about what they plan to do. We actually, and me and I'm speaking on behalf of some of the other residents, we don't, we actually don't have a problem. We like it, especially the fact that they're keeping the church itself. And I mean, I don't know if any of you guys are from here, but I, for me, I grew up in that church playing basketball, going to church the whole nine. So, I mean, at first I was apprehensive, but I've seen and I've talked to them about as far as what they're doing. I don't see it hurting the neighborhood. I only see it enhancing the neighborhood. And the fact that, again, they're willing to keep the church structure itself means a lot. So, and part of what I've spoken to them about that they said they're doing this, the neighborhood having something for the people in the neighborhood can actually come to as well. That means a lot. So don't know if you, how you guys feel about that, but I'm, I actually... I'm in favor of it, so. Thank you, sir. Okay. Appreciate it. Welcome. State your name and address. Thank you. Hi there. My name is Micah Pringle, uh, 300B Edith, uh, just a couple blocks up off Meridian. Um, been a resident in the area for several years and have spent so much time walking and running past this exact property before having any knowledge of what the potential was that existed in it and often being fearful of what could come of this beautiful building and this structure. Just a couple blocks up, there's another church that might not have been quite as historic, but nonetheless was right there and just suffered a fate of being leveled for the purpose of just generic development. So personally, I've been excited to know that there's the potential of this structure being preserved and not only preserved, but enhanced in such a way that the entire community benefits from it. A uh, personal axiom that I live by is a rising tide raises all ships. And I hate to think that uh, some, some very potentially rigid text could impede the potential of this entire area being elevated in a way that it probably needs. All of Nashville is agile. As humanity, we are agile and we are ever growing. So to limit that growth because of something that feels as though it might not really be that relevant, particularly focusing on height, when height is something that the entire area is experiencing this surge in just a couple blocks up on Cleveland. We're seeing a development that's already at this height. Uh, to me, as a resident and as somebody who is in favor of healthy progress, especially for communities that are lacking a little bit compared to a lot of the rest of the areas in Nashville, I am deeply in favor of it as a resident, uh, and as somebody who's in favor of healthy, sustainable progress. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wishing to speak in support? Seeing none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? All right. Rebuttal? Any any other comments since there was no opposition? No, I don't think so. I think everyone said it for me, so thank you all. Thank you. And I didn't see the councilman here, Sean. He's not here. All right. Seeing no one else wishes to speak, we declare the public hearing closed. And Commissioner Haynes, you want to go first? Why did I think you were going to pick on me? Um, staff, can you can you walk us through? I know it's in the report, but what, what are the intended uses for the sanctuary and the academic wing? And have they confirmed that? And have they committed to that in the original SP? Um, so from the original SP or from what they're proposing today? Well, are they changing the uses in the sanctuary in the academic wing today? Um, so it would be, um, and the applicant can correct me um, if needed, but it would be part hotel with the um, option for retail and restaurant spaces. So what's changing really is the number of hotel rooms that would be permitted. Um, from 35 to 89. Um, the original SP also stated that it, any use would have to be in the existing structure on the site. Um, so this would permit the additional, the uses to be per permitted in an additional structure as well. 
Uh, so, perhaps, can, can you, yeah. can you come up? The question to be, um, what's, have we changed the uses in the existing structure? Well, well, what, what is the use of the sanctuary, and then right. what is the use was, of the academic wing? The McGavick SP entitled it for 35 hotel rooms and some other uses, and we currently show 35 hotel rooms in the church. In the church? Yes, sir. And in the academic wing? Uh, yes, sir, both. But the academic wing and the church are kind of one and the same. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I really like this plan. I struggle because of the policy with the four-story height of the addition and not quite sure why that has to happen to make this work, except for bottom line economics. Um, I'd be more comfortable with some type of step down from four to three to two. I know Patrick said it's almost as high as what could be built next door. Well, it's eight feet difference between 40 and 48. So that's, that's material. Um, so based on staff's recommendation or a deferral, I'd be supportive of a deferral so we can continue to work on this. I do think the new structure needs to step down in height. Commissioner Henley. All right, there we go. Uh, it's not going to be me today. Um, well, I, you know, one of the things that, that resonated with me is, you know, uh, I'm from the neighborhood. Um, I drive past the, the site quite often. Um, I've, I've personally really disliked seeing it vacant for so long. Um, it's directly across from the school. I don't, I don't think that sends the right message to our youth. And, and, I, and I've been familiar, I won't say involved, but familiar with some of the previous attempts to really try and bring this back to life and understand the need for some supplemental uses and an additional structure because of the economics of it all. I mean, we, we know the world's changed quite a bit since 2016. One of the things that, that does jump out at me is the attempts to balance, right? I think that's something that's really important, um, really activating the streetscape, um, creating an area that, as it's at least presented here, seems to be open and, and activated for the community. I think is really important. The you know, I, I've I resonated with one of the one of the folks that came up here and spoke in person. I've been a part of a failed attempt to preserve churches in that neighborhood. Um, it, it's a very very bitter feeling when you see something you try to save um, be taken away. And I think this is an opportunity uh, to to do just that. Um, to meet the spirit, I think, of, of what we want to do as opposed to meeting the exact letter of the text. A couple of things that, that and, and you mentioned it, uh, Commissioner Haynes, is, and hope I can get clarification. So currently, the transition that we're talking about, the, the site to the east, it would, it would allow for 40 feet of height without any modification to entitlements at all. Are you talking about what the existing adjacent residential permits or? Yes, yes, the adjacent. Sure, permit. Amelia, can you speak to what the, and maybe go to the zoning map, I think might be helpful, and then you can talk through um, what's permitted by, um, there we go. Um, so our site is shaded there in gray, um, and then, so the proposed new structure would be on those easternmost parcels, which are directly abutting um, parcel zoned RS5 um, up along Cleveland Street. Um, and so those parcels would be permitted. So um, if today there's an existing single family story, um, one single family, single story structure on the site, um, if they were to redevelop, um, I believe they would be able to do three stories and 45 feet based on the RS5 zoning. I, that's helpful. I mean, in terms of context, I definitely respect Commissioner Haynes's point of really trying to make that transition as, as clean as possible. My one, and, and I, I'd love to hear from my fellow commissioners, my one challenge is, you know, and, and I, I will not try to design from the bench here, but I do know when you start to modify these structures and you reduce the usable space, um, a lot of times, especially to move forward economically, you, you require a business model that's a lot more um, geared towards premium or higher end offerings, um, which, you know, that community has gotten a lot of already. Um, and, and sometimes it's, it's, it's opportune to be able to create spaces that the community can still utilize um, because it is accessible in terms of a price point. Um, and I think one of the things that would be really special is, you know, you have the opportunity to create a restaurant where people who attended the church 
can go and dine at the restaurant. And so I, that, that's not lost on me when we think about some of the things that we weigh and we balance. But I'll listen to my fellow commissioners. Council. Thank you, Chair. I'm very familiar with this site. Um, back in my very early neighborhood days, uh, as a neighborhood leader, I worked with a lot of the uh, other neighborhood groups in the East Nashville community and uh, worked very, have worked very closely with both McFerrin and Cleveland Park neighborhoods for many years. Um, I have some of the same hesitations that I think Commissioner Haynes has, uh, that it, it does seem like kind of a lot for the addition. Um, and I do know that this has been lingering for a while. Um, at the same time, I do know that both the Cleveland and McFerrin Park neighborhood groups are very, very um, active uh, organizations. They meet very, very regularly. Um, even, for instance, with our East Bank planning study, you know, they, they were very thoughtful in their deliberations and really gave us uh, some really good recommendations. And I think the fact that I, there are letters of support that we have received, but I haven't had an opportunity to really hear anything formally from the leadership of either of those neighborhood associations uh, gives me a little bit of pause. Just because I, I, I think that if, if they were asked to give an opinion, they would give a really good opinion, and, and that would be very helpful to me in assessing whether this large of an addition is appropriate or not. Um, so for, for me, I would I mean, I have some of the hesitations I think that Commissioner Haynes does, and I would be more comfortable maybe if we had a, a deferral just to allow Councilmember Parker to maybe check back in one more time uh, with those neighborhood groups and get some a little bit more formal neighborhood uh, uh, expressions of either support or concern for the project. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we discussed uh, this proposal at the Historic Zoning Com uh, Commission meeting, but we did not talk uh, the policy. Uh, what we discussed was how this plan meets uh, historic landmark design guidelines, because these buildings uh, kind of revitalize and restore uh, very historic uh, significance uh, windows and repurpose and they did uh, presented a great design and as far as wing is concerned uh, when historic zoning commission uh, discussed was the new addition was subservient to the existing four-story uh, sanctuary. So in that sense, and it has enough differentiation of the material and design, so uh, therefore it meets guideline. So I still think this is a great uh, proposal and great repurpose. However, as a planning commission, what bothers me, uh, concerns me is existing supplemental policy. And so as of right now, I'm not ready to disapprove it, but I am in favor of deferral. Uh, by deferring it, if uh, the applicant and staff can come up with somewhat more uh, reasonable uh, compromise to meet um, policy. So I do understand this one addition has front setback. So it ca can be lowering towards uh, existing um, single family structures. So it might be, I don't know what the uh, uh, com compromise can be, but I am interested here ongoing um, conversation and discussion with the staff to meet much closer to existing supplemental policy. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, so similar to all of my fellow commissioners, I agree this looks like a, a great plan um, and a really creative way to, to retain the use, you know, to retain this building, which, you know, the, the renderings make it look like quite an impressive space. Um, I do understand the concerns as well. Um, you know, obviously we are bound by our policies or we, we try to take those into close consideration and at all times. So, um, you know, I, I do think we need to, to keep that in mind. Um, I think I am leaning in the direction towards the deferral. Um, you know, this is a pretty significant project and I guess, you know, not hearing from the council person, um, you know, I would probably want to hear if, if they had, I don't know, did he, I don't see a letter or anything. Do we have any indication? Okay. 
So that would that would be something. Um, I guess I had one other quick question, and that just looking at some of the renderings, I think this is for the applicant, but. It, what does the the other side of the building look like? It looks like it's just aluminum. Does the applicant have someone that can answer that? And state your name and just state your name Absolutely. and who you're with that way. Uh, Jane Cracker, I'm the owner of the project. So the idea for the addition was to kind of wrap that around and create another kind of courtyard space between the existing um, uh, academic wing and the and the new build. And so kind of create that courtyard again, um, as Commissioner Johnson supported, keeping those existing openings and everything on the academic wing intact, creating kind of that courtyard space between it and then maintaining that uh, consistent materiality all the way through the addition. Okay. 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 Thank you. Um, nice well, I would be inclined to um, make a motion for a deferral, but I don't know if yeah, anyone we just, else. That's, hey, um, Lisa, would a, how long of a deferral? I think everybody. It's March 9th in the report. March 9th? We had suggested March 9th. Yeah, when we do one okay. meeting deferrals, it's very challenging because the turnaround time of when we have to get staff reports published give us like a day to try to work on something, so. I guess, so, so um, the staff report does provide some, some examples of what you would want to see. Um, so I don't know that we need to go into great detail on that. Um, I think mentioning them, Vice Chair, would be good, maybe, or have Lisa mention them. Lisa, would you like to, I mean, I... Like a summary? Maybe. Yeah, would you like to summarize what's in the staff report? Certainly. I think that um, I think that our entire goal has been to just bring it in closer into compliance with the um, supplemental policy that was put on the property at the time that the SP was adopted. And so that speaks to heights um, indicating, I think, two stories, although, you know, we're certainly willing to consider others if we feel like that it is in, in keeping with the goals of the supplemental policy. Um, and so... Um, I would say that just generally to bring it closer to compliance with the supplemental policy. Okay. Um, one other question on the supplemental policy. Sorry, I'm all over the place. Um, it, the staff report says it kind of guides the property going up um, from Cleveland to Vaughan along Meridian. Does the supplemental policy go over to the east as well? So the supplemental policy covers the entire site and what it did, so there, so the red line that outlines all of that purple is the supplemental policy. And essentially what it said is that where you have sort of this SP that is adjacent to um, residentially zoned properties, then that's where we want to take sort of extra consideration. But in this case, that's really limited to that eastern shared property line, yeah. if you will. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, I think that that makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, I, I would urge some flexibility <laughs> to try to take into account, you know, the creative design, um, but I would support a deferral um, until March 9th to... And so, Vice Chair, we have another question before we make yep. a motion. And Councilman, you recognize. Uh, thank you, Chair. I was able to text over to uh, Councilmember Parker just for those meeting schedules, and I think the... Um, he's indicated that the uh, Cleveland Park neighborhood tends to meet on the second Thursday of the month. And so uh, it might be helpful uh, to him if, if they could place that on the Cleveland Park Neighborhood Association's agenda for that next month. That'd be really tight for March 9th. And so uh, he's asking if, it, if we, we might consider a three meeting deferral just to allow that time for those exist to places on those regularly scheduled meetings. We, we don't. Would there be an issue with that, Lisa, for procedurally? Three meeting deferral. What date would that put us at? March. March 23rd. Okay. All right. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you for And so I think the winds are blowing for a three meeting deferral. Then I'll make a motion that we have a three meeting deferral to March 23rd. That's a proper motion and a second. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Commissioner, I didn't see you over there. I'm sorry. I apologize. You're going to have to yell. I, but you yeah, still I, ask I, I would just say this. Um, having worked with McFerrin Park, sometimes their agendas are fairly set in advance. So I just, are we expecting that as kind of a condition to come back to us? Is that 
I mean, we never, so we've never said, and let me be clear. I, I don't That's think, expectation. Commissioner, yeah. we've never said like that the neighborhood has to approve it. We've, if we disagree with a neighborhood or a developer, or we have disagreements with other folks because we're our own uh, entity and we have our own thoughts and we have a very diverse commission. So, I, but I would say it's, we always um, look to make sure that the public input and transparency and discussion takes place amongst the neighborhood. So I would say that, and I think that's why the three meeting deferral is appropriate. So we, we took the vote and I, I did not announce that it, the vote was approved and uh, I need to make sure that the lawyer thinks I'm okay. Okay. So it's approved um, unanimously for a three meeting deferral. Thank you, Commissioner. That's a very good point. And I just want to be clear that, you know, we, we don't rely on a neighborhood approval for our own decisions, nor does the council. But we definitely take that very, very seriously. And it is oftentimes why we defer things. So, okay. Thank you. All right. So that leads us. Um, I do believe that... Um, and uh, Commissioner Clifton, we'll wait till he gets back before we start the other. All right, just give us a few seconds. We're waiting on the other commissioner to come in here, so legally he has to be in here before we start the other. Welcome, Commissioner Clifton. We are on item number 22. Amelia, you're back again. I never left. Um, we're, are we ready? We're ready. We're good? Okay, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead, everybody. <laughs> Item 22 on the agenda tonight is 2022 SP 084001. My name is Amelia Lewis, and I will be presenting this item. Uh, the request is to rezone to SP to permit an additional 80 units to an existing multifamily development to permit a total of 189 multifamily units on the site. Staff's recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Uh, the site is just under 18 acres located on the east side of Amelie Drive, south of Amelie Court. The site has been developed um, with existing multifamily units, which would remain with the proposed development. Uh, these existing units are primarily located in the middle and the southern portions of the site. Um, the northern portion of the site is currently undeveloped. Uh, the site is currently zoned R10. Uh, the surrounding properties are primarily residential. Um, to the north and the south, we have um, R10 with one and two family residential uses. And the properties on the west side of Amelie and to the east of the subject site are zoned R10 and multifamily um, residential and have also been developed with multifamily units. Um, so the proposed site plan is shown on the screen. Um, the existing units are referred to as District 1 in the proposed SP. Um, so you can see the existing site layout um, there where District 2 proposed, um, District Two refers to the proposed new development on the site. Um, the proposed SP would retain the um, existing units and permit the addition of 80 multifamily units within that District 2 um, for a total of 189 units across the site. Um, looking at the proposal for District 2, um, there are proposed uh, five uh, detached structures. Two of those structures um, would be oriented towards Amelie Drive, while the other structures are oriented internally. Um, these structures would be limited to three stories and 45 feet in height. Um, the existing units in District 1 are oriented internally to the site. 
um, in our two and three story split level structures. Um, there is an existing uh, vehicular entrance along Amelie Drive to serve the existing units and a proposed second vehicular entrance would be added to serve um, the proposed uh, units in District 2. The two drives would be connected um, towards the uh, north, well, I guess I should also mention a little late in the game, but um, this is oriented. So um, north, um, this arrow is lying to you. The north property line is actually on the right side of the screen. Um, so those two drives would be connected at the northeastern um, portion of the site. Um, so we have two policies on the site. Um, the first is conservation and the second is suburban neighborhood evolving. Um, so the conservation is primarily um, shown on the site um, where we have areas of steep slopes. Um, so for the most part, that proposed developable area is located um, on the northwest portion of the site where you can see kind of out of that conservation area. Um, <laughs> The suburban neighborhood evolving policy on the site um, is intended to provide uh, residential development um, with at a suburban level of density um, with additional housing choice that may not be traditionally considered in suburban neighborhoods. Um, staff's recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Thank you, Amelia. And so we'll open item 22 for public hearing and is the applicant in the room? Welcome. You have 10 minutes and can save two of the 10 minutes for rebuttal. Please state your name and address. Uh, okay, thank you. Once again, I forgot to bring the tall mic extension, so maybe next time. Um, Andrew Walters with the Catalyst Design Group, um, the applicant for the project. Uh, thank you for service to this body. Um, the owner developer of the project is um, Amley Partners, they're actually AB at Real Estate. They just purchased the property in 2021 and have dropped about $3 million into the existing property. So they're very committed to be a long-term holder in the neighborhood. And uh, they apologize they couldn't be here tonight. They had some uh, outstanding commitments that they had to attend. So um, wanted to say this is an example of a project that's really done a good job, I think, of, of meeting with the community, uh, meeting with the council member, hearing the concerns of the neighborhood, and then working hard to address those. We've actually had two community meetings so far. Uh, this was originally on the January agenda. Um, we had had a community meeting at that time up, up before that, um, which was lightly attended to present the project. Um, but we had not completed a traffic study or a speed study, which was recommended by NDOT at that time. And uh, you may have seen in the packet during the January agenda, there was a lot of email and correspondence that came. Uh, a lot of them came from the Huntington Ridge uh, development, which is actually to the west of the, the main entrance that's existing now at the top of the hill. And so, um, as part of that, what we what we learned from getting that correspondence and we deferred it in January was that um, people had a real concern at the top of that hill at the existing entrance, and so we took that seriously. And part of the speed study recommendations that were were laid out were improvements potentially to that intersection. And uh, so we had a second community meeting on Monday night this week. Uh, which was pretty well attended. Council Member Nash was there and um, was in support of what we were doing and, and basically had a really good discussion. And I'll try to summarize this briefly, but the main thrust again from the community was that intersection of Huntington Ridge at the top of Amelie Drive, which is right at where the existing um, driveway entrance to the development is, okay? And if you've ever driven out there, it is a very steep hill. It's not something that we would get approved and, and design uh, in current design standards. But when this road was built, that's how it was constructed. And so what happens is both both uh, intersections there, the, the Huntington Ridge against Amelie and this driveway, is a very treacherous turn, particularly a left turn, because you really can't see the traffic that's coming and they can't see you. And so one of the big recommendations that came from the speed study is there's a way to do some signalized, um, not, not a signal, traffic signal, but a signalized flasher where we lose loop detectors and flashers 
that warn oncoming traffic that there's somebody parked at the intersection and potentially vice versa, that warn folks that are parked at the intersection ready to turn that there's a, a vehicle coming. Uh, the details of that we have not worked out with NDOT, but what was really encouraging is all the neighbors that were in attendance on Monday really like that idea. Uh, it's a relatively simple solution, doesn't involve a lot of um, tearing up of the roads and, and existing work. So we just need to coordinate that with NDOT. And so Council Member Nash was uh, fully in support of that solution and wanted to and will and committed to the neighborhood on Monday night. I wish he was here, but we can confirm that. But he committed to them that he would put that in writing in the council bill that we would make those uh, recommendations uh, as part of our final plan. And so we were excited about that and we left there with, with a really good uh, feeling from the neighbors that were in attendance. Um, in addition to those improvements that were recommended by the speed study, we also have a TIS, uh, which is recommending striping and laneage uh, uh, reassignments a little bit on Emily uh, and some signage. Uh, so nothing, nothing major has come out of the TIS, but all of those will be um, adopted as part of the council bill as well. Um, in addition to the traffic improvements, um, new curb gutter sidewalk along Amelie, which would be a benefit to, to pedestrians that are walking uh, and, and in that neighborhood. And then stormwater, which is always a concern and, and certainly part of what we deal with uh, right there at the, would be the northwestern uh, property corner where, where the drainage ditch comes down and intersects. Uh, there's a pipe that carries water underneath Amelie Drive. And we've made a commitment that, you know, as part of this development, we'll be detaining potentially over detaining, uh, certainly treating the stormwater that gets to that point. And, you know, our commitment is that it's gonna be better because we're not gonna, we're gonna be controlling that runoff before it gets to that culvert. And if we need to make downstream improvements, um, of course, stormwater will, will flag us for that during our uh, review. So with that, I'll reserve the rest of my time um, for responses. Uh, I think there's some folks here that may not have been in the community meeting, so I'm happy to respond when I can. Thank you, and Thank you. Uh, we will reserve two minutes for your rebuttal. All right, anyone wishing to speak in support? Come on up. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. John Michael from the Thompson Burton Law Firm, 1801 West End Avenue. To each of the commissioners, thank you for hearing our matter this evening. Touching on a couple of the points that Mr. Walters, my friend and colleague, that are primarily engineering points, we wanted to really emphasize, because there is conservation policy on this site, that was something we had to take seriously, first and foremost in our analysis of whether or not there could be any additional construction on the site. Uh, space available, yes. Square footage and FAR available, particularly under an SP pursuit, absolutely. But the portion of the property in this particular image, I won't try to recall the cardinal direction uh, misalignment, but say the big blob of green trees is going to stay a big blob of green trees. It's steep slopes. It's something that we would never be able to get into and have no intention of getting into. However, for a long time, this stood as residentially zoned property. And as we sometimes see with older developments like these, you'll see an R10, an RS20 with a whole apartment complex on it that's been there a long time. Council Member Nash um, uh, called me off guard when he said, oh, I know that property. That's the first place I lived when I moved to Nashville uh, in a year that preceded some of those in the room being born. But he had great stories about remembering being there. And of course, it's always been zoned the way it's been zoned. So although we originally sought to simply right size or right zone the property, it became quickly apparent that the SP was the more appropriate route. We think that with the helpful feedback that we've received not only from the neighbors who've attended the neighborhood meetings, but also from Ms. Lewis and the other staff members, we now have the best idea of how to shape the project with the updated stormwater guidelines. We have an idea on how to best manage runoff, much better than was originally the case in the years of original construction. And with that, we humbly solicit your support, uh, your vote for approval of the SP as presented. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wishing to speak in support? Seeing none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up. Welcome. State your name and address, and you have two minutes, and there's the timer. Okay, great. I'm Allison Tierney at 513 Amelie Drive. So thank you all. Um, yeah, I could talk about traffic first. Um, definitely appreciate, you know, the traffic study that went into place found that there was a lot of speeding, that top of that hill needs to be addressed. But I think that the entire street needs to be addressed. If we're talking about adding 80 units here, we're talking about on the low end, 100 cars, maybe 150, 160 on the high end. There's a middle school actually at the end of the street, just about 200 yards from the development. There are three bus stops along Amelie Drive. I just have concerns that adding a flashing light is 
is just not going to be enough. We're seeing more cars cut through on their way to work every single day to avoid some really major roadways, um, and they're just frankly not going to slow down for that flashing light, I fear. So I don't know what else we could look at there, but I think the traffic study probably warranted a more significant look. Um, in addition, we have had some issues with that drainage um, ditch or the line that's going through there. One thing that I have a question for maybe staff and the developers is it's very unclear who owns that, if it's the property up this road, if it's the city. Um, there's been some pretty major issues with it. We've had basement floods. Uh, obviously, you know, the whole city has experienced a lot of additional water lately. Um, and we really don't have an answer yet on whose that is and how it would be maintained, if it would be changed. Um, and, you know, how close they can build to that drain because the current site map is probably only 10 feet from there. So those are my comments. Thank you, and we'll try to answer those questions for you. Thank you. Thank you for coming down. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up. Welcome. Hello, John Tierney at 513 Amelie Court. Um, I want to thank all the commissioners and staff for your time. Um, we were able to attend the first of the two meetings that were done for the community and were able to get some good feedback on what this um, would look like. One of the things that I want to point out is that uh, I did not see any sort of notices posted along the, along the street or any mailers come out for the meeting tonight. So I think just talking to some other neighbors, I know there were some other people who were opposed to it, but I'm not sure if they were notified that there was going to be the meeting going on tonight. Um, one of the main things I want to bring up is along the north side with um, the particularly the height differences that exist. So where our home is over there in that neighborhood street, there is a pretty significant height difference. Um, so with three-story buildings there, it would block out a great deal of the natural light that would be landing on our property, um, which I believe would greatly decrease the amount of property value that, that we currently have at this time um, because of that. I'm also concerned about just the amount of distance that is there. Um, I would like to see a, a greater amount of distance and some additional foliage because of the sort of neighborhood culture that we have right now. Um, I think just that many buildings that close to us would really impact um, our values and the, the culture that we have in the neighborhood. Um, I think that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up. Yes, my name is Gilbert Gilchrist, and I live at 517 Amelie Court. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, the first issue I wanted to bring up is uh, that uh, that whole, our whole backyard, as well as the property in question, it, it, it's a solid sheet of limestone. And so we're very concerned about the blasting that would be necessary to put in all the utilities. Uh, let me say that uh, I worked 30 years at National Electric Service as a field engineer. So I am quite familiar with construction. Um, I retired in 2014. And um, so we're extremely worried about the blasting. Uh, our house sits on a concrete slab for the most part. Now, the kitchen and dining room are over a crawl space, uh, which is where there's been a lot of flooding in that crawl space. My wife, prior to our getting together, spent uh, thousands of dollars putting uh, drainage uh, catch basins and a sun an elaborate sump pump system to try and keep the uh, flooding down. Now, um, you know, where you're building this new road, you're eliminating a lot of grass area that uh, absorbs the rainfall now. I mean... Our backyard, the top of our backyard, is almost even with the, our roof line, so it's very steep. So, um, I guess I'm out of the, I, I, I'm worried about the value of the house going way down. You know, I'm afraid this is going to really affect the value of our house. Thank you, sir. Uh, Two minutes goes by quick. Any, anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Come on up. 
Do I have a hot mic? Are you able to hear me? Thank you. Jennifer Squires, 336 Huntington Ridge Drive in townhomes. I mean, just pull street. it towards you though, a little bit. There we go. That, yep. Better? A little more. There, right. We'll start your time over. Hold on. Thank you. There you go. Jennifer Squires, 336 Huntington Ridge Drive. I live across the street in the Honey Ridge townhomes. I am not so much opposed as much as I would like to see the condi conditions be a little more um, considered. Uh, this is quite dense as far as my consideration of how many homes should be built in that particular area. My biggest concern and one that we've discussed is the traffic. We've discussed it a number of times. Before we have um, more development here, we need to address the traffic on Emily. It needs those signals, the flashing sensors. Now, if we're building another 80 homes, we're gonna need a lot more than just flashing signals. And it's a tricky area. So I would just want to uh, communicate that we would love for NDOT and as well as you guys to really push that forward and address the concerns that are there. My other item is that I would say it's probably twice as many homes that need to be, that are being proposed here than could be built. I'm not sure that the community could take more than just 30 or 40 more homes there, which would bring your cars um, and your traffic and your home area to a more reasonable. So I think it's a little more dense than it needs to be concerned. A number of the things we've talked about in the community, and I was at the community meeting uh, earlier this week, and that we've talked about in Huntington Ridge is the drainage consideration. We have 224 homes on top of that ridge. It is a true top ridge. We do have the limestone, and that has become an issue for us that we've had to deal with. We would want them to address that, as well as, um, the runoff and the storm drainage. And I appreciate your time so much. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate that. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? All right, seeing none, rebuttal, two minutes. Okay, thank you again. Um, Andrew Walters with Catalyst. Um, so I'll try to run through these as best I can. On the ownership of the drainage ditch, very good question. There is a drainage ditch in that, um, in that area where you see the type C buffer, uh, the first 10 feet of that off the property line is actually a, a concrete flume that was built years and years ago, and it is encapsulated, or it is inside a 10-foot drainage easement. So it's private property, which is in a public drainage easement. And that's where we, we do expect stormwater to have us look carefully at that during the technical review of the design and make sure that that's adequately sized for the runoff that's going to it. And likely, I would expect us to make improvements at that culvert where, where all that water comes down. Um, as you guys know, we'll have technical requirements to do that during our, our plan review. Um, I appreciate the mention of the additional speed study recommendations. I did not cover those in the interest of time, but the other two recommendations that were uh, outlined, and not, I say recommendations, options that were proposed, and we've covered this at the neighborhood meeting on Monday, were some speed tables along Emily at some various points on the north side of that Huntington Ridge Drive. So going towards sort of our, across our project frontage, there was a series of speed tables um, that we talked about. And then the other one was a roundabout as you get closer to the uh, Huntington Parkway intersection at the Huntington Parkway intersection, which is south of this entrance before you get to Old Hickory Boulevard. The neighborhood, candidly, and, and Ms. Squires was there and, and hope she would agree with this. They were a little bit lukewarm on the speed table and not really excited about that option and were really opposed to doing the roundabout. So that's why I didn't cover those in the recommendation. But those were two other options that we kicked around at the community meeting. And where we really landed is to focus our efforts on the intersection there at the top of the hill. Uh, meeting notices were mentioned. I think probably the, the confusion there was that um, we sent them out for the January meeting when we got deferred. Obviously, we don't repost and everything, but the signage should have still been on the site. And so hopefully folks were able to find the, the meeting tonight. Blasting. Um, well, I'm out of time. I can address those other questions if you guys want to extend. Yeah, well, if we have questions, we'll okay. call you back up. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and I did not see the council member, so seeing no one wish, no one else wishing to speak, I'd play the public hearing closed. And Vice Chair, you want to go first? Um, thank you. Um, 
This one is is tough. I mean, I think from a from a policy perspective and looking kind of at the surrounding um, development pattern, I mean, it is, I, I, I see how it's consistent on the one hand. Um, there's a fair amount of, of multifamily in the, in the um, area, but then, you know, they're also surrounded by a lot of single family as well. So I, I do see how this amount of um, this, this development scale would be, would be a lot. Um, it does seem like the traffic is the biggest concern. Um, and I, and I do sort of tend to think what the neighbors indicated that a flashing light may not be sufficient, but, um, I guess there's also opportunities to address that as it goes forward. If there are other concerns that are raised, um, I don't know. I don't know what other kind of an option we would we would suggest for that, but it does seem like there might be a need for a little bit more um, analysis on on the traffic um, coming down Amelie. Um, I'm going to listen to my fellow commissioners. I am definitely torn on this one, um, so I'll listen. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Uh -huh. It is always hard because uh, this particular parcel of what we call District 2 has been open space quite a long time. So when open space become not open, occupied by a housing, uh, of course, you know, adjacent neighbor always have a concern. Uh, so in that point, so I asked staff if this was a deed restriction or part restriction, so uh, which is none. So I think a uh, property owner has right to develop. So when it's developed, uh, would it improve? Uh, I think uh, I see on this plan a couple of improvements. And if I'm not mistaking those green uh, area between the existing development and proposal, does it say reforestation? So I'm thinking, so they are planting trees in there. A revegetation. I'm sorry. Uh, the green area between the dark green area, revegetation. Yeah. So yes. it's a sorry. Uh, sorry, it's a little bit of both. Um, it's both preserving that area as not a building area, as that's where a majority of that uh, slope area is in the conservation policy. But then they do indicate um, also a revegetation along there. I think is to help work as a natural retainer. So that would be a one improvement. And I, th on the plan, I think it says existing uh, concrete drainage will remain. But I heard from the uh, applicant, they will work with the stormwater and improvement is needed, uh, they will address. So if I'm not mistaken, that's what applicant says. Can we add that as a condition? Certainly. So the way that, so with SPs, as you all know, they're a multi-step process. So the first step is the preliminary SP, which is the step that we're at now. When a final site plan comes in, then they do detailed um, construction, construction drawings, and those include um, grading and drainage and stormwater plans. And so stormwater does a very technical, detailed review of any projects. And um, you are you can't allow for more runoff post development than you have pre development, and so stormwater would be analyzing that. Um, existing stormwater facility to determine if it needed to be upgraded in any way to meet those those requirements. Um, right, so it will remain. It may need to be modified to meet the stormwater regulations. Yeah, that would be great. You know, if existing concrete is adequate, it remain, but, uh, you know, improvement is needed. Uh, I think I heard the commitment from the applicant. Uh, that were plus. And also, could you address the, the blasting? I know the uh, state of Tennessee requires blasting regulation, and so it notifies surrounding neighbors. So if you would touch on that, that would be great. Sure. So all of the blasting regulations are actually at the state level. Um, Metro um, sort of serves as a clearinghouse for getting 
getting a permit, but all of the inspections and the regulations are actually through the state. Um, and so, but also, and, and the engineer may want to speak to this, but because of the topography and the way that it lays, there's probably limited blasting that would actually have to take place. Um, it's the buildings are designed in a way that they sort of build into what's already there. And so you're not talking about sort of a hillside that you're having to blast to take down to a certain flat level. Um, the topography is sort of working um, in, in favor of the development in this case so that you wouldn't have to have um, extensive blasting. And also there was, there will be a buffer uh, between existing a neighbor and not only the uh, concrete, but the buffer. Could you tell me about the buffer? It's not like a shrub, but actual buffer. Sure. So, and we've got a condition to make sure that it's very clear that there is the, the, the stormwater feature that is existing, and then there will be a 30-foot type C landscape buffer. And what that means is that for every 100 feet, if you think about it, there is a certain number of plantings that are required, and that is made up of um, trees, uh, canopy trees, um, and uh, lower level plantings. And so it's a combination of things that happen within 100 feet, sort of repeated, um, that makes a buffer. So a type C is, is one of the wider, more intensely planted buffers that's required. Thank you. So with this, all the condition and also traffic study is ongoing discussion, and this is one of the conditions. So with this, all the condition attached to SP, I am in support of this plan. Councilman. Thank you, Chair. Um, this, uh, in, in terms of the density discussion, um, there is, a, for one thing, the site has density that's kind of concentrated in one part of it. Um, and it seems to do, to add that density in a manner that is pretty efficient. Um, and so I, I like a lot of the preservation features that are built into the site, which you would have to do anyway. But we know that we do need housing, um, and particularly, um, uh, multifamily housing sometimes. So I, I think this is a good way of um, providing a little bit more street connectivity actually within the street, within the, the overall site itself, as well as adding some uh, traffic control improvements along Emily Drive. Appreciate hearing the discussion that, uh, that at least it sounds like you've talked to the applicants, spoken to the neighbors about a couple different options. We don't have to decide that today necessarily, but I know that work will be ongoing with uh, NDOT. So I feel like this adds some uh, some much needed housing in a location that's at least close to a transit line. I and mean, it's not right on a transit line, but at least, at least somewhat close to that. Uh, it sounds like it's close to a school, which we want to have more housing close to schools. Um, and um, uh, I look forward to um, seeing what the ultimate discussions are like with, with NDOT uh, as this moves through the overall process. But I'm in support of the plan as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Commissioner Henley. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I won't be redundant. I think I feel like, you know, a lot of times when you start on that side, a lot of the, the things I would have addressed are, are addressed prior to getting to me. Um, but I, I do think one thing that really stands out to me is we have a lot of projects that come before us, particularly ones that, um, you know, are in, in communities that have issues and challenges with their public realm and public infrastructure. Um, and I think this is a project that really highlights the ability to leverage development to, to address some of those concerns. Again, I heard traffic. It seems like there's kind of some basal things there and then kind of some additional layers. I think those are appropriate for, for this body to, to really strongly suggest. Um, I think it, it will help there. Um, and then again, flooding, you know, stormwater management is just a huge challenge across our county. Um, just seeing that that's something that was planned to be addressed here already, it, it makes it makes me feel good about supporting the project. And again, the addition and, and diversity of housing, I think, is, is very solid here. Uh, excited to see that there was a lot of engagement and, and hearing from the community. And I think it's always a, a win when you have some solutions that the community kind of supports and, and sees benefit from. Um, so I, with that in mind, I, I support the project that's presented. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Clifton. Yeah, I'm good. 
Well, you know, um, I always try to put myself in the position of, of neighbors thinking about what might be happening. And I'm thinking, um, you know, what they've heard tonight and what they've heard before are things like um, conditions and potentially and details to be worked out and opportunity as it goes forward and, and things like that. And I, I would be here speaking as they, they are tonight, when people who have a little concern. Um, that's what I would worry about. But also, I think, don't know much about this process yet. I've only been thinking about planning for a little while. Uh, and I, um, I'm always happy to speak after some of y'all because it informs me more. But I'm thinking the fact that this is an SP is something that's not, that's not anything intuitive for what citizens would know. Uh, and what really is still ahead of us. If the staff could sort of go through that for me and for them a little bit more. Certainly, so this is the preliminary SP and essentially what this is, is this is the point in the process where um, the uh, uses and the number of units are getting established. And so this is the rezoning to permit however many uses or units, 80 new units on the site in this layout. Um, with these connections, with these sidewalks. And so this plan is what becomes the zoning on the property. Um, this still does have to go through um, a council process where there's also a public hearing. Zoning is a legislative decision. So that is made at the council level. Um, I did have an opportunity to speak with the council member about this. I know that he's very, been very involved and he has uh, let me know that he will be adding conditions related to some of the um, items that the community has discussed at the council level, which is his um, opportunity to do so. Um, so if this is approved at the council level, then the second step is a final site plan. Um, if the final site plan comes in and it is generally consistent with with this in regards to the layout, then it's really a technical administrative review. And that is when the fire department uh, codes, I'm sorry, fire department, um, water, sewer, planning, NDOT, um, stormwater, all review very detailed construction drawings that show how the roads are going to be built, what's going to be graded, how the stormwater is going to be handled. Those reviews can sometimes take four, six, eight months to get through because it's such a detailed technical review to make sure that they are meeting all of the standards that have been adopted by Metro for projects. Um, if a final site plan is then approved, those are typically administrative if it's consistent with the approval of the, of the council approved plan. There's then typically a master plan that then gets reviewed and building safety comes into play at that point. And then there are final building uh, permit plans. And so it is a multi-step process to get to the point where you're actually, and a grading permit is also thrown in there. Thank you. Keep forgetting what I'm doing. Um, I'm always this way when the legislature's back in town. But uh, so you know that's something that's not intuitive to people, and I'm glad you that that, that you went into that detail. Um, that doesn't mean it resolves their issues particularly, but it gives them an understanding of how complex it is when it's this kind of proposed rezoning. Um, I'm reasonably co comfortable with it, with that understanding of how much there is still left to do. Uh, we do need more housing. Uh, people don't like to hear that. I know if it's close to them because like any of us, we, what, we like what we're used to and we didn't really expect things to change a lot. But in this case, I think uh, some care has been taken and will be taken um, to work with the neighbors even more. So I think I can support it. Commissioner Haynes. I think with the commitment from Councilman Nash and the SP process, um, all of the concerned constituents will have another opportunity to voice feedback to make this a better, better plan. So I am in support of staff's recommendation. That leads us to a proper motion. If there's no other questions from commissioners, that would lead us to a motion. I'll move approval of staff's recommendation. That's a proper motion. Is there a second? Second, any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Opposed, no, ayes have it, and the staff recommendation to approve is adopted. And so I have a, um, I apologize, I have a conflict moving forward tonight, and so the vice chair has agreed to take over 
and run uh, the meeting. And so, Vice Chair, you probably want to move over here. Um, I apologize, but I do want to thank everyone for coming down tonight, uh, and we'll continue our business. Thank you, Vice Chair. I'm Donald Anthony with the planning department. This is item 26 on your agenda. Uh, the request is to rezone 9.88 acres located along the south side of Nesbitt Lane from R10 to SP to permit a mixed use development with 194 multifamily residential units and 7,000 square feet of commercial space. Staff recommends approval with conditions and disapproval without all conditions. The property is currently zoned R10 and four radio towers are currently located on the site. Um, adjacent zoning includes R10, IWD, and RS 7.5 and PUD. Adjacent land uses uh, include uh, two-family residential on the north, industrial on the west, residential open space on the southeast and west, and single-family residential uh, on the northeast and southwest. Uh, the policies for the property are conservation and urban mixed use, or T4MU. The conservation policy is limited to a small sloped area near the southeastern corner of the property that would remain undisturbed by the proposed development. The T4MU policy, which covers the vast majority of the site, is characterized in part by high levels of connectivity, a pedestrian-friendly environment, and moderate to high-density residential development, along with mixed-use commercial, light industrial, and institutional uses. I do want to point out that on the next two slides, the plan is oriented to the west, so north is going to be on the right-hand side of, uh, of the image. The proposed SP would have a single point of access on Nesbitt Lane. The 20-foot uh, landscape buffer would be installed along the western and southwestern property lines, which abut a single-family residential development and its associated open space. An existing dense tree line along the eastern side of the property would remain in place, providing a buffer between the proposed SP and the industrial uses to the east. The SP includes specific architectural standards with brick and or stone masonry constituting a minimum of 45% of each building facade. Notably, the site lies approximately one quarter mile west of Gallatin Pike, which is identified as a high capacity transit corridor in Nashville Next. The proposed SP has three major components. Uh, the first is a mixed-use building located along the Nesbitt Lane frontage. This is highlighted in blue on the image on the screen. The mixed-use building would have a height of four stories up to 55 feet with a step back above the third story. The building would include up to 7,000 square feet of ground floor commercial uses and 115 multifamily residential units. Surface parking for the mixed-use building would be located behind the building. The second component of the development is 79 townhouse units. These would be located toward the center and rear of the property. Most of the units would be uh, located adjacent to open space. 70 units would have individual garages and the remaining nine would utilize shared surface parking lots. The third component of the development is a radio tower, which is shown in orange on uh, the image on the screen. This tower will be located near the southeastern corner of the property, near existing residential open space and industrial uses. The tower would have a 200-foot fall zone on all sides. And during final SP review, the tower would be subject to specific standards that are established in the zoning code. The density of 19.6 units per acre, the mix of uses, and the site layout, including the pedestrian elements proposed in the SP, are generally consistent with the T4MU policy goals. Therefore, staff recommends approval uh, with conditions or disapproval without all conditions. Staff can answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. We'll go ahead and open up the public hearing. Is the applicant here? Let's come forward. You'll have 10 minutes and you can save two minutes for a rebuttal and start with your name and address. Thank you, commissioners. And thank you, planning staff. Thank you, Donald. That was a great staff review of this site. 
Um, again, as Donald mentioned, uh, we feel that this is consistent with all the existing policy, the T4 MU. Uh, additionally, the Nashville Next Tier 1 Development Zone and being located along a collector avenue, um, only a quarter mile from the Gallatin Commercial Corridor, um, make this a great opportunity for a transition from uh, the Gallatin Corridor through the IWD uses um, to our east, as Donald mentioned, and then into the adjacent residential neighborhood. Um, I think we all recognize this um, immediate housing need in Nashville, and uh, we're happy to provide a more dense um, housing option here that keeps a lower price point and still actually um, allows for the existing use of the radio tower. Um, it's just a more efficient tower so that all of those existing radio towers are no longer necessary. Um, so we feel like that is truly a highest and best use um, for the site. Um, additionally, the site does incorporate uh, over uh, a third of the total site is open space um, with community access, and that is extended to not just residents but the adjacent community, um, including a number of walking trails throughout the site. Um, there is also a small commercial space within the mixed-use building that would uh, provide an amenity that would be walking distance to neighbors in the area, uh, serving them as well as the residents. Um, we've had several community meetings. Um, well, we've had two community meetings so far. Um, we had one in early January that was in person. Uh, with eight neighbors in attendance, which had a lot of great discussion and great ideas. Um, and we were happy to take those ideas into consideration and incorporate those uh, into our revisions along with uh, Metro planning staff comments um, into the revised SP that we submitted on January 17th. And then we had an additional follow-up uh, meeting with neighbors on February 2nd um, in which we responded to those concerns presented at the initial January meeting. Um, some of those include, I won't go into great detail, but um, providing some additional green space um, and walking trails, including off-site improvements uh, to allow for more connectivity to uh, the adjacent neighbors um, and allow for just more um, safety in terms of walking in the area. There are not a lot of great sidewalks in the area. Um, then additionally, uh, on site, we've added uh, a very robust buffer um, that is actually above what codes would require um, where we are closest to those neighbors. Um, right now it's planned northwest, but it's actually southwest. Um, and then added an additional privacy fence along uh, that boundary per neighbor's request. Um, and additionally, there's a setback there that is, uh, I believe it's twice what the base zoning of R10 would require. Uh, which would be a 20-foot minimum setback. I think we're at 40 to the closest house on that side. Um, we've also uh, incorporated some requests from community members to uh, amend the district land use table for the fallback zoning in order to add um, community garden as a potential use, um, as well as we've removed several noxious uses that would be otherwise allowed uh, within the fallback zoning. And again, that was at a community member's request. Um, additionally, added speed tables uh, within the site in order to slow traffic, uh, because again, I think traffic, um, specifically speed, was a major concern that was raised by several community members. Um, and then additionally, I do have here, um, as Councilmember Van Rees was not able to attend, uh, I do have a letter from her expressing support, if I can read that at this time. 
Um, and this was sent to planning staff. Um, it says, Lisa and Donald, I will be returning from a business trip in Austin, Texas, and will not make the Thursday, February 9th Metro Planning Commission meeting. This is a quick note to offer my overwhelming support for this thoughtful plan for Nesbitt and the Heritage Area of Madison. We had both an in-person and virtual meeting about this project and heard from neighbors within a one mile walking distance of this location. Several questions were addressed and many ideas were implemented that made this project one more Madison development that is happening, quote, for us and not to us, end quote. The virtual meeting last night was recorded and will shortly be on the District 8 YouTube channel and shareable for those who could not attend. If for any reason a community member attends on the 9th with the question causing it to be pulled from consent for a hearing, I ask that the commission please proceed with approval with my pledge that any matters remaining unsolved will be addressed as it moves through Metro Council. Thank you so much, Honorable Nancy Van Rees. And thank you all so much, and I would like to yield my remaining time for response. Can you um, state your name and address, please? Oh, yes, so sorry. Parker Hawkins, okay. Hawkins Partners, Landscape Architects, 110 South 10th Street. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, is anybody here speaking in support of the project? Sure. Come forward and you will have two, na two minutes and start with your name and address. Uh, thank you all. Uh, my name is Joe Newsel, and I live at 4024 Murphy Road, uh, representing the ownership group on this project. So just wanted to say quickly that I was, I've been excited to work with the councilwoman, uh, the community planning staff, uh, our internal team, obviously. And then over the last eight months, we've had the opportunity to work with uh, radio professionals. Like Parker alluded to, we're getting the opportunity to turn four towers into one and really push that one down into the back corner. Um, to meet policy, as, as, as Parker and, and planning staff had mentioned, but then go beyond that to promote open space and a really usable residential community. So we're especially excited about, um, again, the proposed open space and some of the open space uses, uh, the additional planting, and the connectivity to adjacent residential. Um, and then lastly, again, Parker alluded to it, but, but we're really excited about the transition that it creates between that industrial use to a more residential feel. Um, that's all I got. Thank you all. Thank you. Anyone else speaking in support? Okay. How about anyone speaking in opposition? Yes. You'll have two minutes. Good evening. My name is Valerie Scruggs, and I live at 429 Amquewood Court. I actually participated in both of the two meetings that they had, even though we didn't get much communication in regards to it, nor follow-up communication at all from the prior last meeting that we just had. But I wanted to bring up a few things that are going on in that neighborhood that I don't know if anyone's aware of. There is a rifle range from the Elk Club that's behind here that's over there in the blank land, and I, every weekend I hear shooting, and I've actually called the police on it to make sure that it was illegal or not, and it's, there's no ordinance against it, so per the policeman that came to my home. After we had the meeting last week, I brought it up in front of everyone, and they said it was actually illegal in the area to be shooting at the Elk Club, but this past weekend, I heard the same shooting, and I think if you polled every other neighbor, my big concern is, what if a child's playing out there? And I'm not saying they shouldn't have the range. I'm saying that we need protection for all the children that, that might be playing or any other resident. My children, I've lived in my house almost 30 years. My kids all grew up and went to school in that same area. I surely do not want to think that someone's hurt because I didn't bring it up. I also want to mention that there's a train track right there um, on Nesbitt, and I don't know if everyone's aware of it or not, but we don't have a state law where you have to have it constantly moving, and it blocks traffic very frequently. And my big concern, it's a big network for people to get to Gallatin Road, that someone, some of the train might sit there for 20, 30, 40 minutes, and everyone's having to go around Nesbitt to go around it, including the cop that came to my house, told me when he goes home, and the same thing happens to him. And I'm worried for public safety that children or anyone's gonna go through that walkway and try to pass through the train to get to Gallatin Road, and we don't have a safety concern besides traffic. I'm sorry, I have no more time. I have other things, but thank you for your consideration. Thank you. 
Hi. Hi. Bree Williams, 1753 Heritage Oops. Glen Drive. Um, I'm at the house um, out here at the end, the one that's backed up, kind of just back to back to the three units. And I'm worried about privacy, also about the traffic going through, because we've got three other developments, one where there's farmland, one beside the Lowe's, and the Madison Station that just passed, um, all, you know, just creating more. And like she said, you know, the train tracks. And I'm also worried about the height of the townhouse. So I wasn't clear. I know there was like some two to three story ones, but then some that had the garage underneath. And I'm just hoping that maybe we could, you know, at least keep the taller ones farther, you know, closer, you know, to the train tracks instead of, you know, right behind our houses, just kind of smothered up against it for, you know, natural light and privacy. Thank and you. also, I was, you know, um, the new development by the uh, schools, we want that, but I'm worried about classroom sizes. Are the teachers aware of that? Um, Madison is also, you know, we have our MSET, which is our own utility district. W uh, worried about, you know, I've already dug a trench between my neighbor and my, um, my, and my neighbor's houses to try to keep the stormwater going, so I'm worried about more adding to that to mess with the foundation of our house, the integrity of our homes, and value. I mean, I like, you know, some of the walking trails and the open spaces, and I'm hoping for positive change, but I just want to do it in the right way, considering, you know, as many people as possible. Okay. And also, uh, with the apartment place, um, wondering if there was an elevator shaft or if any of them in the townhomes or apartment were wheelchair accessible. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank Great. you. Great. Thank you. Anyone else speaking in opposition? Good evening. You'll have... Two minutes. State your name and address. Sheila Strickland Allen at uh, um, 1712 Heritage Glen Drive, right across from the open field. Um, one of the concerns uh, I'm just hearing about uh, a lot of the development, I, did, I was not aware of the meet, previous meetings. Um, the four stories is a concern to me. Uh, you know, most of the, it's either a one level or two story house or town home in that area. So concerned about uh, four stories going up uh, in the neighborhood. Um, also, just the added traffic and, like she said, the train tracks, when you go across that to get to Gallatin Road, uh, there's often a problem with turning left there. There's only a stop sign, so uh, traffic is an issue there. Um, just um, I would hope that it could remain the, the zoning that it is and not uh, increase the population in that small area so vastly. Thank you. Thank you. Are you coming in opposition? Yes. Okay. You'll get your full two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Don Allen, and I also live at 1712 Heritage Glen. Uh, I appreciate what you do. Uh, being a fellow Metro employee, I know that your job is pretty tough, and I know that the growth in Nashville is inevitable. I mean, it's just growing like mad. Uh, the biggest concern I have is even without the train tracks, you drive up to Gallatin Road, which is a commercial road, uh, to get out there because you've got you've got Nesbitt, you have Gallatin Road, you have Anderson Lane, and if you're coming off of Nesbitt onto Gallatin Road, the hassle it is to get out to maybe turn left. Uh, right's not so bad, but to turn left and cross all that with there's a, there's a red light at Anderson Lane and um, Gallatin Road, but it doesn't. It affects Nesbitt because of the amount of traffic coming out and the additional cars that you are going to add with this development is going to be a headache to get out and then with the train tracks there it is protected train tracks so you have the arms that go down but there's many times between that and Gallatin Road it's it's very difficult to get out I thank you for your time and the service you do to Metro thank you Thank you. Anyone else speaking in opposition? If not, uh, the applicant would like to come back. You have two minutes. Thank you so much, and I will try and be as quick as possible in order to address all of those concerns. Uh, again, great dialogue and discussion uh, from interested neighbors. Um, regarding the Elks Lodge, um, 
issue, I actually do have an email uh, from Councilmember Van Reese, and she is already addressing this with Sergeant Lopez of Madison PD. So hopefully that will be rectified very quickly. Um, regarding the townhomes, uh, there is a maximum of three stories. Um, there's a significant grade change, so sometimes uh, they all more or less are with like two stories with the park under in some cases, but the maximum is definitely three stories for the townhomes. Um, there is an elevator in the multifamily building, so yes, that will absolutely um, be ADA accessible. And to uh, the concern about the fourth story on the uh, mixed-use building, uh, again, that was addressed. Um, we do have a six foot step back on that fourth story um, to make that, uh, I guess, just appear as a lower massing. And there is an additional setback along Nesbitt um, that will help to alleviate those concerns for the, the higher building there. Um, I would like to reiterate again, uh, the additional privacy fence and buffer uh, along those, the rear property along those closest neighbors at Heritage Glen there, um, and a further step back than, uh, step back, I apologize, than what is required uh, in the current R10 zoning. Um, also, regarding traffic improvements, um, NDOT has recommended uh, as a part of the TIS um, additional turn lanes be added from Nesbitt onto Gallatin, both northbound and southbound, and then uh, additional crosswalk improvements at Nesbitt and Anderson Lane. Thank you. Thank you. I will declare the public hearing closed, and uh, Commissioner Henley, since you said they got all the fun last time, we'll start with you. Wonderful. Be careful what you ask for. Um, well, no, I, first, I'd, I'd like to start by, you know, I think addressing the creativity in, in this plan. I'm familiar with the site, you know, and to be able to, to take on the, you know, the effort to condense four towers into one and really unlock a site um, in terms of its potential for development, I think is, is worth being commended just in, in that, from that standpoint. And then also, um, the, the way that, you know, the, the easement that's on the site is utilized to create kind of a string of connectivity from amenity spaces. So I wanted to highlight those from a, from a design standpoint. I do, I do like the plan. I think, um, of course, as I've said many times before here, you know, the, the challenges with the public realm and, and infrastructure are oftentimes the, the things that we hear the most about, um, and, and it, it is unfortunate, you know, as, as we grow, we you know, we, we put a lot of, we tax our infrastructure quite a bit, and, and we recognize that here on, uh, on the commission. One of the questions that I, I had was actually addressed, so thanks for that. It was, you know, kind of the orientation and the height as you move closer to the to the neighborhood. So um, thanks for that being addressed in the rebuttal. I, I, and I know this is, I think I know the answer to my question, but, you know, when I saw the number of units and I, I really saw only one entry point into a private drive, um, I'm curious about that. I think I, I like it because it gives you that controlled, um, very intentional, I'm assuming, um, outlet onto Nesbitt. But, I mean, is that the thought process? I know there wasn't an opportunity to, to create probably another um, egress point due to it being a, along a private drive. Right. So, I mean, essentially you... Sorry. Um, there is limited opportunity for further connectivity. And so um, there are a couple of different pedestrian connections, so that's good. Um, and so there's one vehicular access, which in this case, you know, NDOT has said it's okay. It works from a fire, fire safety standpoint to have the one access. The, the drive is serving as sort of the fire access for the, the pre units that are further in. And so um, ideally, we always like to have sort of public road connectivity. But when you're in a site that's a more of an infill site where the surrounding land uses have already been established, it becomes a little bit more complicated or difficult to try to get multiple access points. And so in this case, um, it is um, just with the, the number of units being the number that it is, we were comfortable with it. Um, and, and again, I'm 
traffic impact. I think one thing that I would mention, I know traffic was mentioned a lot. I think with that one entry point, you almost kind of, you contain the queuing, right, of the traffic on the site. Um, so I, it may not give a lot of solace to the community about the traffic impact. But I do think that's something to be noted, right? You've got that one funnel. If everybody decides to leave that community at one time, they're queuing in their, on their own site. So I do, I do think that's something that's helpful. Um, that's a product of the design only having that one, that one access point. And then last but not least, you know, the areas I see bioretention seem to um, impact the particular um, individual that came and spoke located to their home. So it seems like that is something that hopefully will have a complementary impact versus a negative impact on, on, on um, the homeowners nearby. Those were those were my comments. Again, I, I like the plan. Um, I think it utilized a, an opportunity uh, with the site that, that probably was not seen or not contemplated before. So um, that's it. I'll pass it. Thank you. Commissioner Clifton? I really don't have a lot to add. I, I, I understand um, I'm a member of a neighborhood association that's pretty active. Uh, and always right, by the way, um, according to our council members. So there you go. Um, but I, I don't love what happens with the change that we go through. But but I think um, we live in a city. We live in a big city. Um, we uh, expect to, unlike some, at least I believe it's a tribute to us that people want to live here, and we have to deal with it. Um, as best we can, and it, it's not easy if you're going to have lifestyle changes but, but because of it and worries you don't have now. But I, I believe it has been um, pretty well discussed by my colleague and, and the staff, so I'll be supporting it. Thank you. Commissioner Haynes? Having grown up in Madison um, and seen its decline, I think thanks to Councilman, Councilman Van Reese's efforts, it's going through a tremendous renaissance. I think this is a fantastic repurposing of a site with four radio towers, as Commissioner Henley mentioned. Um, so I, I'm going to support the plan. Uh, Councilman Withers. Um, I think this is a really creative plan. Uh, really like the taking the space under the, or uh, in that easement and kind of creating a central parkway out of it. I think it's a really neat thing. I mean, sometimes you have a, an easement and it's just like a blank space, but really looks like the team has really turned that into an amenity. So I think that's a, a another thing that will add to the quality of life for the, those residents. It won't just be, there is parking uh, and parking parking lanes and even a parking lot in the one area, which I'm not necessarily crazy about, but, uh, but I think that that's pretty well screened. And the center point of this neighborhood is that kind of open space in that easement, which I think is pretty well done. Uh, other than that, it is walkable uh, to Gallatin, assuming the train's not running, and I know that's always an issue. Um, but it is walkable to Gallatin, um, where we do have a lot of really large, severely underutilized commercial lots. We'd love to get density directly on, on it, but I think this adds some density, at least in that spirit of on the corridor adjacent to it, to, to continue supporting um, a little bit more revitalization along Gallatin. I'm also happy to hear about any uh, crosswalk improvements that can be done there on Gallatin, because that's that is our high highest, I think, injury network corridor. So anything we can do there to to beef up uh, crosswalks is is a good thing. So I'm in support of the plan. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think uh, the, there was a question from the. Uh, public but uh, it, during the rebuttal uh, it was adequately answered uh, there's enough buffer to existing uh, neighborhood and height will reduce uh, towards the existing neighborhood so I think overall uh, this is a very well thought out plan and one thing I would like to address is I, I am sure uh, the buffer for the new combined radio tower it was 20 20 feet radius buffer. So that was uh, recommended and safe uh, for the uh, surrounding area. That That is correct, safe buffer. 
It's um, typically when you look at a radio tower, you look at um, what's called a fall zone, um, meaning the part of the tower that could fall over in a wind event or something like that. And um, uh, what they've installed is 200 feet, and we'll compare it against the tower when they actually bring the tower in for us to review and make sure that that's adequate. Thank you. So I think all the condition is uh, in place, and I'm sure Council Lady Van Rees will add if any condition is missing uh, from uh, listening to the neighborhood. So with that, I think I am in support, so I make a motion to approve with a uh, condition. That is great. Second. Okay, motion and second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Motion carries. Um, I know that we've been sitting a long time. I'm going to let Lisa take it and give us an update on item 28, and then maybe we'll take a, a quick break. I don't know. People need to stand up. <laughs> Certainly, um, the applicant for item 28 um, has indicated that they would like a three meeting deferral to defer that item to the March, March 23rd meeting. Uh, okay, uh, a question? It is. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to thank you on each one of the commissioners. Um, I'm Erica Gilmore. I'm the Metropolitan Trustee. We waited two hours to hear this bill, and it was pulled five minutes ago. And it's 10 of us here, and it was disapproved. He didn't even do us the courtesy to say that he was getting ready to pull the bill. She just pulled it five minutes ago, and there have been no community leaders. And so I just wanted to be on record for the people that waited two hours and came down to participate in the process that, you know, it was really... We lost that opportunity we have been waiting. And so I think maybe something, I've been a council member and I've always held um, community meetings. I believe in transparency, but I just saw something happen that was really shrewd and it concerned me. So I just wanted us to go on record that we are not in support of the bill, but it, it would not have happened if I did not have the chance to approach the data. So I think people let me speak. I think it's about 10 of us here that do not support it. Some of us collect. Right. because they found out that the, the bill was pulled. So just to express that, because we may not be able to come back. So I just wanted to share that, and I thank you for your time. I think it's one of the issues. Okay, thank you. Lisa? What, what I might suggest that could address um, the concerns expressed, um, and because some people left, is that potentially... Um, that the Planning Commission would recommend deferral to the March 23rd meeting and indicate that a community meeting needs to be held before it comes back to the Planning Commission on that date. Would, would that be acceptable? Yeah, yeah, that's fair. We just want okay. the, the residents to be heard and to participate in the process. It's not that you agree or disagree with us, but we just want to make sure that we're having the opportunity to participate. So, so I would suggest that that just be part of the motion, that there be a community meeting held uh, by the applicant in advance of it coming back to the Planning Commission. And there's no update on, there's no change to notice, no postcard changes, anything like that that have to go out. That, that's correct. Um, we, we would just, that would just be part of your motion and we would reach out and indicate that they need to, that they need to do that before it comes back. Okay. Sure. How will the neighbors be noticed? Because I was told by a neighbor when I was walking my dog. So just how would we how do we hold the person that the applicant that's bringing this forward accountable in properly noticing the neighbors so that they can participate? So a community meeting is not necessarily required by our process. I think the best that we can do is just ask them to send notices to the same um, uh, area that would be required to be noticed for a planning commission meeting, which is is a thousand feet from the the property boundaries, okay. which is what noticing is required for planning commission. So I think we could ask them to send notice to the same area and to have a meeting in advance um, before it comes back. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Haynes. You look prepared to make a motion. So I will move a three meeting deferral to March twenty third, conditioned upon a community meeting and conditioned upon the applicant sending out the notices again prior to that March 23rd meeting. Proper motion. Um, I have a question. Shh, can we to can we second it and then we can have discussion? Yeah, that'd be fine. <laughs> Would you like to second it? 
So I'll second it for purposes of okay. getting to speak. <laughs> Sorry. So now we're in discussion. Uh, it it hasn't, doesn't come up very often that there's such a clear cut statement about this. And I gather, uh, I'm just wondering for future reference, I know we've, we've already basically decided this one about moving it, but do we have the authority in a situation like this um, to go forward if we chose to do so? There are certain circumstances here that would lead me to want to do that if we ever had the authority. I so. Typically, if an application is filed by an applicant and then they ask for the application be de to be deferred, typically we honor that request that they defer the applicant that the ap that the application be deferred. I don't know if Tara wants to speak but speak to that, but typically we would honor the request that that the application if the applicant asks, we would typically honor that request. I would just agree. You just keep in practice of how you've done it before. It's the courtesy we offer to the applicant or perhaps the council member, but not required by any metro ordinance, I don't believe. It could be in the rules. I would have to look it over. Lisa, you might have a better um, memory specifically of what's in the rules, and I can look at it as we take our break to give you a more definitive answer. Or, I don't need to know it, tonight, but I would like to know. That'd be great. Or the best thing to do, um, since we're speaking on the fly, is for me to get back to you maybe tomorrow. Great. That'd be fine since it's not necessarily pre preventing us from moving forward. That, that's absolutely fine. Okay, thanks. Any other discussion? Uh, Commissioner Henley. Yes, because I, I absolutely understand that the, the, honestly, the challenge, but also the, the potentially the inability for the group that was here to speak uh, this evening to return. I just want to encourage constituents to please email us, put things in writing. Um, it, it's, it is very impactful. We do read those. Um, we do have the opportunity for those to be presented to us um, as, as material, even if you're not able to be present. So I just want to make sure that all those who came this evening hear that um, and then encourage their fellow constituents who may not have made it tonight and may also may not be able to make it in the future to also uh, take that approach. Or I suppose, but Chairman, yeah. we... we we can do both. People, citizens can do both. They can both they can write and, us, and right. many people do, write us and also show up. Just, you know, just want to make that clear. Um, Lisa, I know m many of us will be here on March 23rd, and uh, we'll remember this item. Um, is there anything else in the staff report that should be noted? I don't think, I would guess not, but okay. Not that I, not that I know of, no. Okay. I guess we just let you know we acknowledge that you were here tonight and, and certainly have that on the record. Um, any other discussion? If not, all in favor of a three meeting deferral to March 23rd? Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Um, why don't we take a short break just so everyone can stand up and uh, we'll reconvene in, in uh, five to 10 minutes. <laughs> Um, I think we are on item 331. Okay. Hello, my name is Eric Travers, presenting item 31 on the agenda. This is a request to rezone from single family residential R7.5 to one and two family residential R8 zoning for properties located at 232 and 233 Wheeler Avenue at the western corner of Wheeler Avenue and Tibbs Drive. It has a staff recommendation to approve. The 0 0.55 acre site is located at the western corner of Wheeler and Tibbs, approximately 800 feet east of Nolensville Pike. Both 232 and 233 Wheeler Avenue are um, occupied by single family houses. Um, surrounding uses are residential um, to the north, west, east, and south with RS5, excuse me, RS7.5 to the north, RS7.5 and R8 to the west, RS10 to the east, and R8 to the south. The policy on the site is T3 suburban neighborhood maintenance, which is intended to maintain the general character of developed suburban residential neighborhoods. Uh, neighborhood maintenance areas have an established development pattern consisting of low to moderate density and institutional land uses. 
The community character manual lists R8 zoning as potentially appropriate zoning category under suburban maintenance policy. And there is precedent for this zone in the local policy context. Um, two quadplexes about the site to the south along Tibbs Drive and two, uh, two family houses are located approximately 300 feet west at the corner of Wheeler Avenue and Sanford Avenue. So this request aligns with the existing pattern of two family houses at or near intersections in the neighborhood maintenance policy area. Therefore, staff recommends planning commission approve the request for R8. <clears throat> Thank you. We'll open up the public hearing. Is the applicant here? Thanks. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. My name is John Michael with the Thompson Burton Law Firm here in Nashville, 1801 West End Avenue. I was just calling to make sure that I had the parcel view up from the letter that we submitted in support for our client's project here. We often use the term gentle density to describe projects like these, where we can make the mere click from RS to R zoning, corner lots, alley access, some of those key features that you see other mixed zoning districts in the immediate walkable uh, proximity to the project are often indicative of places where we can sneak in small increases in density that don't necessarily create huge traffic changes, on-street parking scenarios, changes to the infrastructural uh, firepower with water and sewer and fire access. In that regard, we think this is a smart thing to pursue in as many similar lots as we can find. Different clients of mine actually go around looking for these types of setups. I think in Council District 16, in a, on a street on Patterson that was actually part of the South Nashville Community Plan, we pursued a similar rezoning for a different client just a couple of months ago. I believe it was 436 Patterson. Same concept. Looking for the general density increases where we can get in a little more housing uh, in an area where after years of zoning down towards RS through the years, there's not as much density available, and even that, as we know from a development perspective, compromises the ability to bring certain retail or commercial service type options to the main corridor on Nolensville because there's just not as many rooftops and therefore disposable income to support them. This is part of what the council member and her predecessor had all pr proposed in trying to get more commercial development. Rooftops help drive that, even if it is one and two and three at a time. We're appreciative of staff's patient review and the good questions we received in response. Uh, so on behalf of my client, we will humbly and respectfully request your approval of this project. And naturally, I'm happy to answer any questions the board may have, but otherwise save the remainder of our time for rebuttal. Thank you very much. Is there anyone here speaking in support of this project? Anyone speaking in opposition? Come forward and you'll have two minutes and please give us your name and address. Sure, my name's Gianna Lespina. I live at 3512 Sanford, um, about a block and a half from where this would be. Um, I don't know, just to bring to your attention, if y'all are aware, uh, the corner of Tibbs sits on the top of a hill. Once you move further west towards Nolensville Road, it is a hill, um, goes down and then kind of flattens out um, once you get down to Sanford. Um, what I'm wondering on behalf of the neighborhood, most of my street has been built up. They've torn houses down, built new ones, um, cramming three and four houses onto these small lots. Um, generally, they're kind of an eyesore in the neighborhood. Um, they tend to be two, three stories tall, they block out natural light in the neighborhood. Um, there's just so much concrete, flooding has increased in the entire neighborhood, which is why I bring that hill to the attention. Um, on my street alone, flooding's gone worse. Um, we've got probably six or seven houses built in the last three years to cause flooding on Sanford to just go up. Um, so with there being a steeper hill right at the edge of Tibbs on Wheeler, um, once you get off floral down there, the hill gets pretty steep for a quick second. And so I just want to know how flooding would impact that and what, um, like, like, a how they're going to fit that into the guidelines, I guess, as per the like Metro council standard stuff. Um, I don't quite know how to phrase that. And so I guess flooding that goes along with, uh, stormwater cause living in Nashville, we get some pretty heavy storms, which is what causes a lot of that flash flooding. Um, there are plenty of families around here with little kids. So with the additional, I know it's only a couple houses, but that could then be a couple additional cars in the neighborhood. Um, people cut up and down through that road pretty quickly all the time, especially up that hill. I would hate for a kid to get hit or something just because of either like construction, flooding, new people to the neighborhood. Um, and this is not like a concern. Well, I guess it's a concern. Just out of curiosity, like how it would impact the local environment. Like if being such a dense residential area, you need environmental studies. But that's all. Thank you. Thank you. 
Anyone else speaking in opposition? Yeah. Uh, yes, my name is Steve Sanders. I'm at 217 Wheeler Avenue. I'm a registered land surveyor and I've lived there for 60 years. Uh, there, as the young lady before me was speaking, there's a 32, that the property sits up on a hill, uh, three, four parcels down to the west, it's 32 foot lower. Uh, there used to be an open creek that ran at the bottom of the hill. It's been covered up by a box culvert. Every one of those houses to the west of the proposed uh, property in question has flooded crawl spaces and uh, basements due from groundwater. Uh, my best friend lives in the property across the street that zoned R8. The reason it zoned R8, that was all the property around there was uh, changed to, to RS zoning in 2003 to prevent this exact thing from happening. And if you'll notice, uh, the property uh, behind it to the south is R8. That was an existing property. The property across the street where my best friend lives was R8. It was an existing duplex. Everything else was rezoned RS to avoid this particular, this exact situation. And to quote the attorney that spoke before me, they're trying to sneak this in. That's the exact word he used, sneak. Uh, the intent here is clear. They want it zoned to R zoning so they can create a horizontal property regime, which does not require the Planning Commission's approval. Uh, by TCA 66-27-103, that can be recorded, uh, a HPR can be recorded by a master deed, as you're probably aware. Uh, that will be the next step. If this is a rezoned R8, you can bet it will be an HPR. Thank you, ma'am and gentlemen, for your time and commitment. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in opposition? If not, the applicant has two minutes for rebuttal. One of the things we're always happy to see on newer developments is that in the year 2023, we have much more rigid stormwater management regulations that have been in place in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. I spoke on this earlier on a different project. We're in a position to do better than was done with prior construction countywide, let alone in highly residential areas that have been long established residential areas like along the Nolensville Pike Corridor here. Yes, absolutely the plan is to increase density at these locations. It says as much in our application documents. I would hate for anybody to think that that was anything other than that. Because we're seeking R8, which is appropriate under T3 uh, neighborhood maintenance in this area, we are expecting to see the approximately 10,500 foot lot and 12 of five lot be well in excess of the land necessary, um, offer the gentlest increase in density available under the zoning code in this regard. And thanks to the upgraded stormwater management requirements, put the, this property and neighboring properties in a better position than they are today, despite the increase in density at that corner. Again, while we're happy to entertain any questions from the board members or even staff as may be needed, uh, we will once again renew our request for your approval of the project. Thank you. I will declare the public hearing closed. And Commissioner Johnson, you want to get us started? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think this is a very interesting request. Uh, I am looking at the uh, surrounding property, especially properties to the west on the Wheeler. Looks like uh, those properties, uh, according to the uh, puzzle viewer, uh, it was originally a long time ago R8 and changed to RS 7.5 in 2003. Could you tell me about the history and why it was changed at that time? Sure, it looks like that that was at the request of the council member at that time, council member um, McClendon, and that was part of a down zoning of around um, 640 or so acres. And so it was a large um, down zoning of of area from uh, R8 to RS 7.5 and from R10 to RS10. So this was part of that larger down zoning. Thank you. So it, looking at the larger area, uh, this is uh, T3 uh, maintenance, but 
interestingly mixed with uh, R8, even though Dow Jones in 2008, still R8 remains. So in a way, it's not outside of the character to change R8, but still some people prefer RS 7.5. So I'm kind of torn this one. So I will be interested to hear uh, how other commissioners will feel about this request. Councilman Withers. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I've seen several of these come through in District 16. Uh, and I know that Councilmember Welsh is really committed to trying to add some additional housing uh, into that district, which, uh, as Ms. Milligan indicated, had kind of a blanket rezone about two decades ago. But, um, you know, Nashville's needs have changed quite a bit in those ensuing two decades. And our, our need for housing is uh, is increasing all the time. I, I think this is uh, is... I personally think that our zoning uh, is very consistent with neighborhood maintenance. Uh, I'm not certain that, uh, uh, you know, it's just it's just not a, a significant increase uh, of units, but every little bit helps sometimes if, if you can find appropriate locations for them. And this does seem to be an appropriate location. It is a corner lot. We do have some surrounding uses that are multifamily or that are that are that are around it, and so um, I, I think that this is appropriate, especially being as close to Knollsville Road as it is. So I'm in support of the application. Thank you, Mr. Henley. Uh, many, many of my comments would, would echo those of previous um, previous commissioners' comments. I, I, Again, I'm a supporter of, of that incremental and, and gentle density going into these communities. I, I understand the concerns of and impacts of new developments in, in neighborhoods, so those those aren't lost on me. Um, I, I don't believe this is a flood impacted area, at least not by the floodplain um, parameters, but I've, I've had a lot of conversations with um, the neighbors in both this area and further down Nolensville that there are just a lot of areas we're just not aware of but are significantly impacted during rain events. Um, but as, as mentioned by the applicant, I think, you know, our stormwater, uh, you know, our requirements now are, are improving that dynamic of, of neighborhoods as opposed to, to negatively impacting it. Um, so with that said, I, I would be in support of, of um, the applicants. Commissioner Clifton. I've uh, lived for a while in in an urban neighborhood um, that is fairly successful, um, Hillsborough West End, uh, which is made up of RS and R, and uh, R is closer to the main thoroughfares, and RS is further interior. It seems very logical. It it has worked. I mean, I don't have an R8 or an RS75. I have an R6. <laughs> it works just fine <laughs> if people want it. And, you know, they should have that option. I, I'm actually a strong supporter of this. I, I wouldn't be for the whole neighborhood, but it's, it's a corner lot. It makes great sense for all the reasons that Mr. Michael suggested. Commissioner Hines. No comments. Do you want to say something else? I will move <laughs> approval of staff's recommendation. That is a proper motion. Do we have a second? Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Okay. We are on to, I guess we're on item 32. 35. Hey, good evening, Commission. My name is Logan Elliott with the Planning Commission or the Planning Department, and I'll be presenting item 35's recommendation tonight. The request is to revise the preliminary plan for a planned unit development or PUD, and staff's recommendation is to approve with conditions. Uh, the subject site is zoned CS and R8, with the CS being near the interstate 
and the RA being further away. Uh, the surrounding zoning for the area is primarily residential with some commercial zoning on Old Hickory Boulevard to the south and to the east. Uh, the site is currently within a PUD, so it has an approved preliminary plan and this subject section of the PUD will be referred to as phase three and is approximately 141 acres and is approved for 359,000 square feet of non-residential land uses and 460 multifamily units. Uh, the approved plan includes a public street that intersects Old Hickory Boulevard and extends north and parallel to I-24 and ultimately connects through the other PUD phases and to Old Franklin Road ultimately. And uh, the approved plan also includes a public street that makes a loop connection through the adjacent phase to the north. Otherwise, the plan includes uh, private drive, surface parking, and uh, the non-residential land uses are concentrated near Old Hickory Boulevard and the residentials more north and western on this site. Um, here, you can vaguely see the uh, current approved plans for this PUD. Phase one is to the north on Old Franklin Road. Uh, the middle portion in phase two was recently revised through the Planning Commission, and then phase three is the southernmost portion. Uh, the policy is suburban community center uh, where the commercial zoning is applied and suburban neighborhood evolving where the residential zoning is applied and the conservation policy reflects steep slopes on the site and several stream features that exist. Uh, the Metro Zoning Code permits the Planning Commission to approve minor modifications under certain conditions. And in staff's review of these conditions, uh, staff finds that the plan does not meet any of the criteria that would require concurrence by the Metro Council. Um, the scope of the application includes just modifying the site plan of phase three and does not modify any of the land uses or entitlements. Uh, so therefore, the plan or the application does not require concurrence by the council, and the planning commission is the final reviewing authority. Um, so, looking at the plan here, there's four development phases and one uh, open space uh, reservation area. Um, again, the the public street is one of the key features of the plan. The first phase is the yellow portion, and that will provide the entirety of that north-south public street connection. Uh, phase two would complete the public loop road, and these would both be residential uh, phases. And then the final two phases would include the non-residential uses like office, hotel, restaurant, retail. Um, and the, the plan here is generally similar to the approved plan. It's just making modifications to the site plan layout and bringing the, the site plan more uh, consistent with the land use policies. So therefore staff recommends approval of conditions as the proposed plan is consistent with the concept of the council approved plan and we recommend approval. And I will just talk about the cemetery a little bit that was referenced earlier in tonight's meeting. Uh, the cemetery is in phase 3C, which is the red phase. And there is a call out of a anticipated boundary of that cemetery. It's just to the right of the, the proposed public street um, staff, planning staff worked with historic staff on uh, getting appropriate conditions for this cemetery. Uh, Metro historic staff walked the site and visited the cemetery's location. And they, while they agree that there is potentially some unknowns about the boundary and number of burials in the cemetery, that they were comfortable with uh, proceeding tonight with this plan with a condition that a ground penetrating radar would be completed um, to uh, further document and provide some confirmation about where the, the boundaries are. Um, so that will be provided with the final site plan application um, and the cemetery will be required to be buffered per the Tennessee state law. Um, so the, the cemetery was something that staff worked to protect uh, with this um, application and that completes my presentation. Thank you very much. Is that applicant here? And we'll open up the public hearing. 
Good evening. You'll have 10 minutes and um, start with your name and address. Okay, my name is Mike Hunkler. I'm with Gresham Smith. And uh, I've actually been involved on this portion of the PUD for almost 20 years. So this is a this is a prime opportunity to actually make the connection between Old Hickory Boulevard and Franklin Road. We've got phase one, which is a multifamily driver. Um, there are four property owners out of the 400 acres. I represent the 140 acres to the south. Uh, we first met with Councilperson Lee in March of 2022, almost well, 11 months ago. Then we met with the Cane Ridge Community Club in April of 2022. Uh, they presented us with a five page request wish list for our PUD revision. Um, we submitted the PUD revision in June of 2022. So we've been waiting since June. I've been waiting longer than that to get on this agenda, but since June. And the primary reason that we are submitting a revision has to do with streams and uh, wetland buffers. In the original PUD, which is almost 40 years old, the whole site was graded. We can't do that anymore. There's wetlands, there's streams. We've done studies on the streams, the buffers, we, and the habitats. Those have all been uh, concurred by TDEC, Fish and Wildlife, and the Corps of Engineers. So we can see the buffers on the streams. So we are constrained by the environmental requirements. Uh, Metro Historic Preservation, as Logan said, and the Tennessee Historical Commission both have studied the cemetery. And we're, we're going to provide an archeologist to go out and observe grading and along with the GPR, the ground penetrating radar, we have no intention to move any graves. We're gonna avoid any kind of graves. We've already had to shift the road towards the stream buffers to miss the cemetery. At some point, there's no more room to shift and no more room to add buffer to the cemetery. We've now met with the Cane Ridge Community Club five times. We've met with Councilperson Lee four times. The adjacent residential neighborhood to the south, October Woods, the one that's most affected by that uh, phase four, supports our revision. The council person supports our revision. We were deferred from the January 23rd meeting and we met with the neighbors on January 30th. Many of the items from the request, the wish list, are details of final PUDs and construction documents. So we are in concurrence with the staff's recommendations and the conditions and request that you approve our plan to go forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, uh, Quan Poole with Waller Lands and Law Firm, 511 Union Street, Suite 2700. I think to start, it's, it's important to note that the reason that this this uh, this case is before you is for very minor revisions. Uh, there, there needs to be an adjustment to the road and, and the layout of the apartment buildings. Uh, and so because of that, it triggered a, a, this review before the this body. But everything that the the uh, my client uh, who is um, developing the red portion that you see and, and is the owner currently of the yellow portion um, has done has been better for the neighborhood. That there there's no change in density. There's no change in uses. Uh, there's actually a, a slight uh, uh, decrease in amount of commercial. Um, uh, square footage is going to happen through this PUD revision, um, but they are clearing approximately five less acres of land. So there's going to be more trees, less grading, and they're going to stay away from all the streams and buffers that you see um, on this site plan. So from an environmental perspective, it's going to be much, much better uh, for the neighborhood. 
Um, but then more importantly, as, as we talk about the, the cemetery, and, and I have the letter here, so the Tennessee Historical Commission as well as the Metro Historical Commission walked the site in an attempt to try to survey the, the, the area that they believe is, is that cemetery. Um, and, and reading from the letter, which I think is a, it's a part of the packet, um, the, 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 and this is um, uh, Graham Perry who, who authored this, this letter, um, he, he does highlight that that's, that's likely that they may have been some minor adjustments to where uh, the, the actual true boundaries of that cemetery lie. He, you know, he acknowledged that it's difficult to ascertain that. Um, but what he said is that it's highly recommended by this offer, office that ground penetrating radar survey be done primarily to establish the cemetery's actual boundaries. Um, GPR, which is what that's uh, the acronym for that, is arguably the most reliable scientific method for locating graves. And so that's what my client, that's what staff has recommended that my client do, and that's what he is comfortable doing. That that is, a, you know, not us saying this. But this is the most reliable method to be able to identify if there are remains there. And certainly if remains are discovered, we're going to follow all state, local, federal regulations as it relates to buffering uh, and, and staying away from those areas. Nobody wants to um, in any way develop over what, what could be someone's um, family member's grave, obviously. Um, spoke with Council Member Lee earlier today. She was supportive with us moving forward. There's been significant engagement with the community over the last eight or nine months. Um, we were deferred from the, the January meeting. We had a community meeting with Kane Ridge that, that lasted over two hours. I would say there was north of 50 members there. Um, and so there was a lot of comments. A lot of the people there were from October Woods, and we've got letters of support from them. So with those things, we, we support staff's recommendation. We'll abide by all of those, and, and we would ask for your approval. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, is there anyone here speaking in support? Good evening. Good evening, Jeremiah Wooten, 1828 Wild Oaks Court. Um, I live right across I-24 from this, um, but I bike by the property every day on my way to school um, on the, the northern terminus. I think it's not this parcel that's being considered tonight, but a, a further extension of this project um, on Old Franklin Road. Um, I will say I, I, I like to think I follow Planning Commission very closely, but um, I had a lot of questions about this because the PUD process is not something I'm familiar with. Um, we don't hear about it a lot in a PUD revision like this, um, and especially considering this um, PUD is like more than 10 years older than I am. Um, so um, reading through this, um, hearing from the developers, I, I want to point out a lot of the improvements, and I think there are um, many. Some of the ones I'm really in favor of are um, the changes to the roadway. Um, the original PUD had a like a five-lane cross-section, two lanes in each direction, and a continuous center turn lane, which I think if you've ever driven around Nashville, we're suffering from trying to fix a lot of those um, very old style of roads. So this um, takes away a travel lane in each direction, only provides turn lanes where they're needed. Um, so there's a continuous and a running median um, instead. So a lot more um, impervious surface, a lot more green space, a lot more pedestrian accommodation. And another thing I didn't realize with a PUD revision like this, um, they're required to comply with all um, new regulations in regards to street trees, sidewalks, and stuff like that. So we'll get a lot of those improvements as well, um, even if they weren't spelled out um, specifically in the plan. Um, I also think with the multifamily, they're shifting from a um, two, three-story split to a three, four-story split. So there's no additional units, but concentrating it in fewer buildings, again, to preserve more open space, preserve more um, natural land, and also concentrate that density a little more to promote more walkable neighborhoods. Um, and then finally, the last thing I was concerned about, the, the improvements along the south end of the project are gonna to lead to this huge um, roadway cross section near I-24. And I believe they have dedicated an easement um, to allow some cross access to an adjacent property too. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else speaking in support? Anyone speaking in opposition? Good evening. I'm requesting the five minutes to speak for Cane Ridge Community Club. Um, I'm Twanachick, 5967 Cane Ridge Road. I want to start out by saying that 
I had to harass Graham Perry to get him out there. That was something we accomplished, and it was our idea to make the roadway less. So we're really happy all of that happened, but I just want to be clear about that. There was a long list of changes that we wanted to see in order to not oppose this amendment. I want to acknowledge that several items have been incorporated. The roadway will be smaller. Traffic calming by design is now partially being incorporated. Another meeting was held with the community. An easement is being provided for a nearby church, and the buffer between the development and October Woods has been accepted as satisfactory by their HOA president. Additionally, some improvements and conditions have been agreed to regarding the cemetery. Note that the developer advised us we saved them millions by supporting their reduction in the size of the roadway and by being agreeable to going up instead of out. It's great for everybody. There are still important items that the development plan is still missing. We've asked for these items repeatedly, and I ask that you consider these items during your deliberations. We ask for these additional items, whether it means changing this to an SP, you adding the conditions, them accepting the conditions, or otherwise altering the plan. Whatever it takes, we request these following items. Uh, one is there's been a lack of participation by Nishath and Patel, who own the 21-acre parcels closest to Old Acre Boulevard in the blue. Uh, by approving this PUD tonight, you will approve an included large section that has had zero community input in over two decades. This is an inappropriate, and this large section should be removed from this PUD. Those owners said, we'll see if someone wants to buy it from us to develop. That's in the Tennessee, and they have told tonight's developer that they are out of country. I don't expect you to tor torpedo the remainder of the development because these two owners won't participate. So I ask for a condition that when these owners of the blue section seek to begin development, both community engagement and Metro Planning Commission approval is required. Alternatively, please add a condition that even minor changes in the section require a revisit. Number two, we're asking for a cemetery maintenance plan. We appreciate the support of Metro and state historical reps. We're still asking for conditions above what they can legally require in order to protect reasonable, reasonably this cemetery that holds the remains of enslaved persons whose presence is documented on the 1850 slave census. Our requests come after much discussion with archeologists, historians, preservationists, and other experts in the field. I'm asking the developer here and now to publicly agree to a condition of a cemetery maintenance plan to prevent future damage to stones and the ground cover trees, flower markers, historical fencing, and other items associated with the cemetery. Markers from the 1800s do not withstand string trimmers and mower blades. This plan should follow the recently enacted Federal African American Burial Grounds Preservation Act, which will make federal monies available for assistance. Number three, there's some additional NDOT-related standards where you have asked for a bus rideshare pullout so that MTA service can be added and people can safely get on and off whether they're using a bus or a rideshare. And we'd like the higher visibility, safer pedestrian and cyclist crossings that Walk Bike Nashville recommends. And we'd like a speed limit of 25 miles an hour applied throughout the entire development. We've also consistently asked in Cane Ridge for walking and biking trails and pathways to be incorporated. This developer doesn't want them to be public. That's fine. We want them to be internal. We want the residents there to get to enjoy the beauty of Cane Ridge. This will connect all the way up to Old Franklin Road, and we think those pathways ought to run through the other sections. The other two sections are incorporating those. And there's a huge chunk of reserved acreage, what's in white, that's not explained as a condition of approval. We ask that to be labeled as reserved. Development requires Metro Planning Commission approval so that it is clear it cannot be developed without returning here. What I'm not bringing up and I wish would be included is providing opportunities for feedback over the next decade that they say it's gonna to take to build and some other things. Let me state again that it's inappropriate and unfair for developers to get PUDs and rezonings and wait decades before developments and not have to come back fully to the community. Please stop this where you can. If we don't get a full opportun opportunity to apply the lessons we've learned, what's the point of all that we've learned over the last years? It just makes our hearts heavier and sicker because we are even more aware of the mistakes we are allowing. Please accept this developer's willingness to impose these conditions on himself or you use your authority to impose these conditions. I appreciate you very much. 
Thank you very much. Anyone else speaking in opposition? If not, the applicant will have two minutes for rebuttal. Well, j just briefly, I, I, I want to say that I think I think the reason that there's not as as stringent of uh, notice requirement as it relates to revisions is because they have to be minor. If we were adding density, if we were adding additional uses, if we were doing something that was substantially different than what was previously approved, then yes, there would be more robust uh, uh, requirements. So I, I would take issue a little bit to the extent that we are are not including the neighborhood because I, I do think we've done that substantially over the last um, eight to nine months in working with the community. I, I would say that over the course of those eight to nine community meetings, We've uh, had engagement with at least three to 400 members of the community. Uh, they largely have supported this. They, they haven't come out in droves to speak out in opposition. I think everybody on this commission is very familiar with the Cane Ridge community, and they are not shy about voicing their displeasure when they don't agree with development. So I, I think the fact that there's not a large drove of people here tonight speaking in opposition speaks for itself. Uh, again, we are, we are willing to abide by the, the conditions that the planning department have, have laid out as it relates to uh, preservation here, and we would just ask for your uh, approval. Thank you. Thank you. I'm running out of options. Councilman Withers, <laughs> start with you. Uh, thank you, um, um, Madam Chair. Um, I, I appreciate the commentary about the public I'm sorry. I forgot to close the public hearing. I'm oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Go forward. Um, I'd be interested. I appreciate the, the rebuttal with information about the community engagement, but I'd be interested in hearing from the applicant. We, we have heard from a community member that has some additional things that maybe haven't been included yet. Um, could we go through that list and, and uh, get an understanding of reasons why those were not in, incorporated? Just, I mean, <laughs> is that okay? So, well, I, was just, I think a lot of them, and I think Mike will speak to this, is that there's, those are things that you would see on the final plan. And so mm -hmm. without being, we haven't gotten fully into the site. And so that was just at an initial threshold level, some of the difficulty with, with some of those things. Well, I understand. So if, if I could just run quickly through at least what I jotted down. So one is for the the blue section. Is it, it is it the case that there are no changes that are requested to the blue section? And so that's why it's not included at this time. So the, the owner is out of the country. Oh, I'm sorry. Can I, let me let me answer this. So this entire area came in for a revision. There are not significant changes in the blue area, but the blue area is included for approval with this overall revision. So this is a particular sort of grouping of phases, mm -hmm. um, A, B, C, D, E. Um, and so all of what's sort of shaded is included um, in this approval, but there aren't substantial changes from the council approved plan in that blue area. Okay, thank you. And so, and so it's consistent with what council has approved. Okay, thank you. Um, for the cemetery maintenance plan, um, what, what are the plans to, to, after we identify the cemetery, uh, what are the plans to protect and preserve it? They're gonna follow whatever the recommendations come from the, the Tennessee Historical Commission. I think the issue with adding uh, additional buffer is that that boulevard has already been modified. And I think there's very little space that remains there. And if you were to push the boulevard even any further away, then essentially you would have to revise all of the, the multifamily housing, the apartments that are there, those would have to shift because the, the boulevard would then get so close to the creek mm -hmm. that the apartments would then have to shift to the other side of the creek. And so it, it, I know it seems like very, a very modest request, but because the boulevard has already been shifted so far away um, from, from the, the existing cemetery, any pushing it any further completely changes the... the, the well, I definitely understand that, but so the cemetery itself, though, is is it's is is part of the private property, or is there a uh, an endowment that pays to maintain it, or just in terms of I think I heard um, about um, 
using land, even things like, you know, landscaping appropriately so as not to damage the stones. I'm a big cemetery buff myself, so I, I love running around old cemeteries and definitely those old stones often are very, very porous if you can read them at all, but we would, we would want to avoid uh, any further damage uh, to the to whatever stones remain than, than is today. And, it, it, and is there a plan to address that through the maintenance? Yes, so my client has, uh, and we communicated this with, with Council Member Lee, that when we do the, 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 the radar technology and we're able to properly survey that area, and if there are remains found there, we are committed to doing the maintenance plan that, that has been outlined. It's just now they, they he says, I don't know, uh, one, if there are any remains there, two, where they are exactly, but if they are found, he, he says, yes, he's willing to do those things. And for planning staff, is that something that would be also be handled through the final version of the PUD review or? Yeah, we've got a condition that they would have to do the ground penetrating radar um, prior to any final site plan approvals. And with that, um, there would be, you know, a requirement. It's not unusual. This is not the first project that we've seen where there is a cemetery located within the area. Um, and so typically those are placed sort of outside of development, um, fenced, uh, Sometimes there might be parking spaces, those sorts of things. But that's all the details that we look at with the final site plan when we know, mm -hmm. we know generally based on the information from the state and from our own local historical, the, the location. But once you get those precise locations finalized, then you can do things like put the fencing around it and make sure that you've got it set aside and not being infringed upon by development. And the state also has regulations related to um, cemeteries, and so we rely on that as well. Okay. Um, we had a commentary about uh, a bus a bus or some of the pedestrian or ride share and uh, bus access. Can you help us to identify where on the site that is and, and or where it's requested and? Okay, and that's one of the details. We have no idea if there's even gonna be bus service on this road. And if, if uh, it's, we go, it used to be MTA once, a bus pull off, uh, that's something we can handle okay. at final construction documents. So there's no issue there at all opposing that. Okay. Um, and then for the speed limit? So, same comment. Same comment. We, okay. we can't recommend we, it by end We can't set speed limits. Right. That, a that's a conversation that has to happen with our Department of Transportation as it relates to um, the classification of the road and the speed limit. So um, that is that is not a decision that can be made here. Right. Right. Okay, but as long as there is a, is a plan to address that, so. Okay, I think that, uh, I, I appreciate that. I heard from Commitment and wanted to go through those. I, for, I think this might be for planning staff with the question about the reserve parcel or what is, the, there was a comment about a reserve parcel and how, how would that be handled? Yes, phase 3E is the white shaded uh, phase, it's the center and uh, bottom portion, and it's got a lot of uh, steep slopes and environmental areas with conservation policy there, and this plan does not show any development there. So no development is being approved for that portion of the site with this revision, and any future requests for development would either require a revision or a rezoning amendment application if they were increasing any of the land uses. Okay. Well, thank you. That, that's very helpful. I appreciate everyone just spending uh, time to go, go through those things that came from public comment because I know the um, community members in Cambridge are very uh, very thorough and detailed, but also very thoughtful. They care a lot about their community and want to make sure that things are done well. So I appreciate that. Um, with that, that answers, I think, all of my questions. And so I'm genuinely in support of the plan. It sounds like it's got a lot of good uh, improvements over prior versions. So that sounds good. Okay. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I think uh, fellow commissioner uh, asked lots of questions I wanted to ask, so many questions are addressed. Uh, Logan explained uh, very well uh, about our role as when it comes to part revision, but I just want to reiterate and wanted to ask the blue section, uh, phase 3D, because this time uh, applicant is not 
uh, proposing any change uh, to this plan, so just to leave as is. So it's not our role to demand change or ask change. I just want to confirm that. So it's generally the same. There is a slight change in the road layout, and so it is generally the same as what was previously approved by the council. If they want to make further revisions that you know move buildings more than just slightly, then they would have to come back. But at this point, I mean, there's a the the road has been realigned slightly, meaning that the blue area has changed from the originally council approved plan, but it's generally in keeping. And just like with any other PUD, if they were to want to come back and move something around in one of these, they'll have to come back for another revision unless it's, you know, very slight changes that we would consider to be compliant with the revision, so. Thank you. Uh, with that, I think everything is in the plan and all the questions, especially most important uh, cemetery preservation question and applicant will be following a state and his, uh, metro historic zoning recommendation. So I am in support of this uh, revision. Commissioner Hens. Um, in studying this, I think the modifications are minor and so I'll support staff's recommendation. Commissioner Clifton. Thank you. So um, obviously a lot of work has been done on this and could have been. It's pretty uh, ambitious to try to deal with the cemetery and, a, and an active and aware neighborhood group. Um, and it's taken some time to get here. You might be almost there. I'm not sure you're, you're there for me exactly um, because I'm there's something about he hearing things mentioned in a public setting like this that you might already have heard before but um, I'm not at all sure that there's not a little bit more discussion that could be had to make folks happier with what might happen and I know that that may not be a legal standard for what we do but there's no presumption that we will rezone or will approve something there just isn't there's limits on what we shouldn't do, but uh, I don't think there's a legal problem with us being as sure as we can be, because this, while, while the neighbors and the owners and developers have been on this forever, um, we haven't been, <laughs> this group hasn't been. So I'm not necessarily opposed to this. I just don't think I'm gonna vote for it right now. I think it could be made a little bit more clear um, with a little bit further massaging from people who will be affected. So that's that's my reason for not being able to vote for it. Thank you. Commissioner Henley. Yes. Uh, well, first I want to commend um, the, the community members that came and spoke both um, in favor and in opposition and very, very thorough, um, very much appreciated. I, I like the level of intention to, to reviewing things to come before this commission and the time taken to, to, to come here before. So I just wanted to, to highlight that. Um, and also some of the things that were brought to my attention of kind of the phasing and how, how that is appropriately done and brought back before us based on what comes. And I think that addresses at least one of the comments uh, that, that we heard from the opposition. I mean, I, I understand that the plan seems to have improved from where it was um, in a lot of ways. That, that gives me some, some uh, confidence. I understand that there's still some work to be done and glad to hear that the Historic Commission is involved, particularly as it relates to um, opportunities to get guidance on the best way to treat the area, right? It's an area we don't know a lot about. Um, it's, it's, there's still a discovery phase that is happening. Um, so I'm glad they've been engaged. And then ultimately, um, the explanations that were given around the modifications that have happened, um, maybe not exclusively related to, to the cemetery, but, but definitely um, as, as a key factor, um, modifying and, and shifting things so that um, that area can be um, preserve to, to me is, is a good inclination of, of goodwill. Um, the understanding just the natural features that are there um, and the challenges that may come along with trying to make further modifications. I think it's not for me to say, I think it's for us to deliberate on, but I think we possibly could be at that point to where, you know, further 
um, emphasis on particular modifications could require this to just change form in, in terms of what would have to come before. So I am mindful of that. But what was presented today, um, of course, hearing from, from the community, I, I feel that I'm able to support what's put in front of us, um, and especially with the, the staff conditions. Again, the one that stood out to me the most is the, is the requirement to really study the cemetery specifically um, through ground penetrating radar, um, and then the commitment to continue to work with the historic commission following that. I think those are two things that really stood out strongly with me. Okay. Any other discussion, or is someone ready to make a motion? I'll move approval of staff's recommendation. That's a proper motion. Motion second. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Okay. Motion carries. Um, okay. I think we have got two more to go. So item um, 37. Okay, item 37 on tonight's agenda. Again, I'm Logan Elliott with Planning Department and I'll be pre presenting staff's recommendation. The request is for concept plan approval to permit 99 single family lots. The north parcel here was the subject of a subdivision application at the July 28th meeting of 2022 and the Planning Commission recommended approval of that subdivision. So a concept plan is approved for the north parcel. And this application proposes to expand the subdivision onto the, a portion of the parcel to the south. And staff's recommendation is to approve with conditions. Uh, the zoning in this area is RS-15. And the property is approximately 45 acres on the eastern side of Tulip Grove Road. The policy is suburban neighborhood evolving with conservation policy for stream buffers. Um, the T3 suburban transect requires that chapter three of the subdivision regulations applies um, and this application utilizes the cluster lot option. Um, the site plan proposes 99 single family lots. The development includes public streets that make connections to existing stub streets that were planned to extend. Um, it also includes stubs for potential future connectivity to the south. Uh, the plan avoids the areas with environmental features, uh, which are numerous and kind of scattered around the site. Uh, and the plan also includes the required recreational uh, amenity features. Um, the cluster lot option uh, does not allow more density than what would be allowed under the RS-15 zoning district. Instead, it allows a reduction in lot size to create and accommodate open space, um, which this application does. This application, uh, cluster lot options are required to provide 15% open space, and this plan has 39% of the site uh, remaining as open space. Um, and they are providing 99 lots when the cluster lot option could potentially yield 112 lots. So they are within the lot yield and requirements of the cluster lot option. Um, so in staff's review of this application, the plan meets the subdivision regulations as well as the zoning code requirements. And this plan uh, carries over the condition from the previous approval that the uh, extension of the Rachel's Ridge road connection, which is the most northwest or top left uh, road connection by the roundabout that they would apply for a uh, speed reduction uh, The Rachel's Ridge currently has a 15 mile per hour speed limit. And uh, I believe the MDOT standard is typically 25 in situations like this, but the applicant is committed to applying to the traffic commission to continue that 15 mile per hour speed limit on that street connection, um, as well as some of the buffering commitments that were previously made on the plan are being maintained here. And that completes my presentation. Thank you, Logan. Good evening. I'll open up the public hearing. Good evening. My name is Emily Lamb. 
My name is Emily Lamb. I'm here from the Thompson Burton Law Firm at 1801 West End Avenue on behalf of the applicant. Um, thanks to Logan and everyone at Planning for their help on and working with us on this project. As always, they uh, do a great job and we are appreciative of their expertise and their help. Um, Staff thoroughly examined this project, and as their report reflects, they determined that this project meets not only the zoning code, but the cluster lot provisions and the general plan specific to this area, as well as the subdivision regulations. You'll see in their report that many of the specific zoning regulations that outline a maximum uh, are well, we're well below the maximum allotment, um, and those that set forth a minimum, we are well above the minimum. For example, the uh, minimum open space is 15% and we are um, providing 39%. Uh, we're entitled to 112 units and we're only asking for 99. So we've worked hard to meet all of the applicable legal requirements and would respectfully request your approval of this um, application. The policy for this area is T3 Neighborhood Evolving Conservation, which has a specific goal of creating a wide range of road networks and increased connectivity, which this project does by extending stub streets that were never intended to remain permanent dead ends. As staff reported, the project creates shorter and safer routes for pedestrians and cyclists, as well as alternate routes for emergency vehicles. This connectivity is a key feature of Nashville Next generally, and this transects specifically. We are essentially, this project is essentially acting as a puzzle piece that will um, allow surrounding areas to connect. And because the project fits so well within the T3 um, policy, it necessarily complies with the general plan since T3 is even more specific than the general plan. This policy uh, for this specific area also calls for sensitivity to environmental features such as steep slopes and water features, um, while simultaneously providing for housing options, a variety of housing options and improved connectivity. The project we're proposing today utilizes the cluster lot option in order to meet the goals of preserving the environmental features and the natural state. And of course, I've addressed the connectivity that we um, have uh, achieved. As the staff report also points out, we held a community meeting for this project, and as a result of that meeting, we provided some features specific to address their concerns, such as landscaping and buffering, and a subdivision monument sign at the street connection of Rachel's Ridge. Um, so for all of these reasons, as well as the specific reasons that are pointed out in a uh, staff report, we would respectfully request your approval. We believe we've gone above and beyond um, to meet all legal requirements here and re would request your approval. And I'm um, happy to entertain any questions you might have after the public hearing um, and would like to reserve my time for rebuttal. Okay. Um, anyone here speaking in support of the project? in support, in favor of. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening, it's been a long night. It has been a long night. So let's get everybody home or dinner or something. Can you start um, with your name and address? I'm Jewel Jones of 1061 Chillip Grove Road and we have lived for over 40 years at home place. And so it's not only the home place of our immediate family, but all along Chillip Grove Road is um, home place to our extended family. So when we moved there over 40 years ago, there were not any developments. So we watched every development along Chilip Grove Road come to be. We welcome, we welcome our neighbors. We welcome that. We think it's going to be safe, especially for my mom. She really um, wants that neighborhood feel around her so she can feel safe. Uh, we feel like it's a very well thought out plan. Um, we also think that this plan is complimentary and it will have a complimentary impact. We understand the concerns of our neighbors and we respect that. And we feel like this group has thought through all of that and they have met and will meet all the criteria and the regulations or the rules uh, by the commission and, and the other powers to be. Um, as this is an amendment to the previous approval, we are asking that you guys continue to support the plan. Thank you very much. Anyone else speaking in support? Good evening. Good afternoon. <clears throat> uh, my name is Alba Jones. Uh, I live at 1061 Tulip Grove Road and have been residing there since 1978. And 
Over the past, over the past 40 years, uh, I've seen a lot of development uh, in the neighborhood, and it has improved the neighborhood, it has been improved the community. And for this development, and we asked the Planning Commission to uh, approve this development, uh, actually to approve the uh, amendment to this development. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, anyone else in support? I'll open it up to anyone in opposition to the project. <laughs> now is your time. <laughs> you probably figured it out, but two minutes and state your name and address. Well, my name is uh, Rick Luff, L-U-F-F. I live at 3548 Glen Falls Drive in, in Hermitage. I've attended a couple community meetings with the builders and their representatives, and they they have been forthcoming, and they have explained in details to me things maybe I didn't understand. Uh, I think they've come up with a very good plan. I, I knew the Williamson family just just briefly when I moved. I moved here in 2006, and I met them right away. Um, I would like to say I like the plan. I, I have a... a a little problem with the enforcement of the of the connectivity issue. Okay, if you look at the, the spots where it connects uh, on Tulip, on Lebanon Pike, and uh, on Lebanon Pike, on Lebanon Dirt Road, and then further off on uh, on New Hope Road, those are all uncontrolled intersections. There's no lights there. It just comes to a stop sign. So that might be some difficulty for us to be thinking of along the way. And also, if you look at the main road that runs through, if you take and extend it out, it runs right past my house. That, my house is the third, third one in. And um, it looks like it's going to be a straight shot from Tulip all the way over to New Hope, which is not exactly true. It's not exactly a straight shot. It comes to a T at uh, Chesney Glen Drive. Chesney Glen Drive, and as well as the rest of the Chesney Glen subdivision, has several rental properties. And as you can imagine, uh, Progress is a big player in there. When you have rental properties, you have people getting roommates and moving two or three people in. So consequently, you got cars parked on the street. And this corner where it comes to a T, um, at Chesney Glen and and uh, Glen Falls has several rentals around there. So sometimes there's some visibility problems looking around the corner. Now, I drive there every day. I'm an old guy, but I'm a professional driver, and I have some difficulty seeing around it. Not to mention the dogs and the kids that play in that area, too. They have problems seeing around it. Uh, 15 miles. Sir, we, we've hit our two minutes. I'm sorry. Can you okay. finish your thought and then... Am I done? Uh, you're done. We have two minutes. Okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time okay. waiting it out tonight. Thanks, guys. Anyone else speaking in opposition? If not, you have your two minutes for rebuttal. Just very briefly, as Mr. Leff said, we have met with him um, and have tried to work out the concerns um, that he has. Ultimately, the connectivity that he is concerned about was previously approved in um, the prior application. Um, it, part of the application that was previously approved included a um, roundabout that will necessarily bring some traffic calming measures. Um, we are certainly, of course, going to comply with all NDOT regulations, so we've um, again, believe we've met all the regulations that we're legally required to. We've gone above and beyond, and many of the regulations um, meet the zoning code, meet the general plan, meet the subdivision regulations, as staff's report has outlined, and so we would um, re request your approval. Thank you very much. I will close the public hearing, and Commissioner Henley, I'm going back to you. Well, I'll start by saying I do like the plan. Um, I, I, I definitely have been one of the commissioners that has, that has asked some questions about the connectivity and, and you know, in thinking through, I think I'll say it that way, the impacts on, on the community as a result of it. 
Uh, and, I, and I understand the comments that were brought up here. Uh, I think, again, it, it keeps with policy, which I definitely understand. I've been educated well enough on that a few times with my, my comments I've made previously. Um, but I, I think, you know, what we've seen and what we're seeing in front of us now um, highlights some of the things that I know we've discussed before as important. I think critical focus on the buffers between some of the existing uh, homes and residences. Um, again, the connectivity piece that I already mentioned. And as, as well as thinking about um, conserving and preserving a, a lot of the area, I, I really appreciate highlighting um, you know, the requirements that are currently in place, uh, but then the approach to go above and beyond that from, from that standpoint. Uh, I think to the comments that were made, I think, and, and as I understand it, you know, what's there now? Oh, Sorry. wonderful. <laughs> You're done, but wonderful. I guess, I guess I was getting a little long-winded. Um, but no, I, I, do, I do feel that what we're seeing is, is appropriate, and, and I do support the proposed concept plan that, that in front of us, as well as um, staff's recommendation. Councilman Withers? Um, I, I think it's a great plan. I think it's very thoughtful. Um, I was a big fan of the connectivity. It sounds like uh, uh, they've done a lot of diligence on it, and I'm in support of staff recommendations. Thank you. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you. Um, nothing much to add. A great staff report, and this is a really uh, difficult site to work with, lots of slope. But I think applicant did a great job placing uh, all the lots uh, away from the critical lots. And I love the connectivity. I know sometimes neighbors don't like it, but I think that's a great relief to the existing neighborhood for to uh, connect to Tulip Globe and so forth. So I think this is a well thought plan and follow uh, T3 neighborhood evolving uh, subdivision regulation. So I'm in support of this, this plan. Commissioner Haynes. I will support staff's recommendation. All right, Commissioner Clifton, you are you are our last one. Well, I made a few notes here. For, no, I uh, no, I do appreciate people coming out um, and sharing their concerns, even if if it's not not the not the main thing people we're hearing. So thank you for coming out. But I actually do believe in this case that that it's a good plan and um, will work out. But um, so I will support that and move we approve. Okay. Proper motion. Do we have a second? Second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Okay. I think we're on our last one, which is item 38. No, sorry. 40. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I knew it was the last one. I just didn't know the number. We'll get there. Yeah. Just hold on. We're going to present. Donald Anthony with uh, the planning department. This is item 40 on your agenda. The request is for approval of a final plat. <clears throat> excuse me, to uh, create two lots on Alpine Park Boulevard. Staff recommends disapproval unless the Planning Commission makes an exception to the frontage requirement for these lots. The property is zoned R10 and is surrounded by other R10 zoned properties. The policies for the property are conservation and suburban neighborhood evolving or T3NE. The proposed lots would have areas of 0 0.27 and 0 0.23 acres, and both would front onto Alpine Park Boulevard. Because the proposed lots would be located on an existing street and are in the neighborhood evolving policy area, they are subject to the infill standards that are set forth in the subdivision regulations. The lots do satisfy most of the infill standards. However, the proposed 46 foot frontage for each lot does not satisfy the minimum requirement for 50 foot frontages for infill lots uh, in the T3NE policy area. Staff compared the frontages of surrounding lots and found that the other lots on Alpine Park Boulevard had frontages of at least 90 feet. And with the exception of a corner lot, one block over, lots in the broader area had frontages of 51 feet or greater. 
The proposed 46 foot frontages do not appear to be consistent with the character of Alpine Park Boulevard and they are less than most of the lots uh, in the broader area. And I would point out when you look at a map of this area, there is an Alpine Park Avenue and an Alpine Park Boulevard. They are two different, two different streets. Uh, staff recommends disapproval of the final plat unless the Planning Commission makes an exception to the frontage requirement. Thank you. Thank you. I will open up the public hearing. Applicant. Just with some photos, because Google Maps does not, oh, we can't do that. Okay. Lisa, you can restart well, the clock. I don't know if we need the full 10, but. Oh, thank you. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. Well. Mm -hmm. Hold on, he sent us his photos in advance so we can pull those up. Yes. Okay. Sorry. And then just hit the button that looks like someone talking just one time. Yep. Okay. Our screens went dark. Is that? Uh, it's just. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, Alex Craw, 610 Basswood Avenue. Uh, thank you everyone for being here and staying late. I feel like the last two times I've seen you guys, I've been the last, so you're saving the best for last, I hope. <laughs> Um, I'm the owner and future builder of the property located at 3220 Alpine Park Boulevard. Our intention since we first purchased this lot here over a year ago was to subdivide the 22,000 uh, square foot slope lot that's zoned R10 into two lots so that we could build two sets of attached townhomes and utilize one shared driveway down the middle of the properties because of the topography of the lot. Uh, we'd like to stagger the homes for privacy and parking, ingress, egress for the rear loaded garages, but also to allow each home to have a view of the breathtaking view of Nashville skyline. Our planning reviewer, Mr. Donald, has informed us that our case needed an exception to the frontage requirement as we are approximately 3.76 feet short of administrative approval after dedicating eight feet to the right of way. Um, I'd like to outline some of the hardships this lot presents, a few factors that make our development in line with other approved developments in close proximity and hopes you consider them in granting this exception. At the very onset, the start of our subdivision process, we were under the impression that only 35 feet of frontage was needed since Alpine Park Boulevard, for all intents and purposes, and some of these photos will show, uh, is a permanent, it's basically three or four different permanent dead ends uh, in both directions of the road. Uh, Mr. Donald did inform us, we kind of had a back and forth of the interpretation of that, that the permanent dead end applies just to the end of a cul-de-sac, uh, that interpretation uh, in the subdivision regulations. Um, these four proposed builds will be our 10th, 11th, 12th, and 13th completed projects within a quarter mile radius uh, over the last three years. So we're very passionate about this area and very understanding of the challenges this specific and unique part of Bordeaux brings. The plat map, which is should be, I think, page two of, I think that's page two. I had fun little arts and crafts project there. Uh, plat map dates back to 1919 with an inconsistent and varied design pattern for the size of lots as well as the roads that service them. The best analogy would be of a wagon wheel with an oval hub instead of a circle there at the peak of Alpine Park surrounded by 
an oval with multiple spokes that go out like Robert Street, Alpine Park Avenue, Fox Alley, surrounded by an even larger oval, Goodrich Street, which has been half abandoned. Uh, then a different pattern emerges, and for abbreviation purposes, like Donald said, it gets so confusing of having an Alpine Avenue that turns into an Alpine Avenue if you go left and an Alpine Park Avenue if you turn right. And at the top of Alpine Park Avenue, if you turn right again, it's Alpine Park Boulevard. So our lot, lot four, as you can see in the attached illustrations, remains unchanged in the 104 years since it's been platted with the small exception of uh, some footage added in the rear when Goodrich Street was officially closed and abandoned by Metro. Lot five also shares 90 feet of road frontage in a similar shape and fashion. Um, the other challenges this area has faced and continues to face are multiple roads, streets, alleys that are still platted but have never been improved or abandoned. These unimproved areas present confusion among the residents and are largely not maintained by any metro department, thus responsibility has fallen back on the owners and residents alike. I've spoke with almost everyone that's lived on this hill in the last few years, uh, some of which have been there for over 25, and it's the, the, the road of Alpine Park Boulevard has never been improved in that time. Any brush or trees that have fallen in the right of way or that block the street have not been picked up by Metro, and residents have been told it was their responsibility, quote unquote. The same goes with trash and illegal dumping, which is a huge problem in Bordeaux, as is most urban Nashville neighborhoods. Every three or four years, NES will trim some of the limbs around overhead power lines, but that's the extent of maintenance on this road, or so I've been told. Uh, I personally sent a dozen email requests to Google Maps so that they would correctly label the streets and addresses on Alpine Park Avenue, Alpine Park Boulevard, and Alpine Avenue. Um, and I think we finally got that figured out. Uh, I've also recently, well, the last year, requested multiple dead end signs as many people that don't know the area will turn and there's really not a lot of room to turn around. So I hope that confusion is all behind us. One resident even told me about an emergency responder that couldn't find an address that was on fire and a small cabin burned. I think that was about 10 years ago. So our concept plan for four homes on the two created lots should also help Alpine Park Boulevard as it currently only serves seven vacant lots and leads to one house at the very, very edge. Uh, it has consist inconsistent widths ranging from 20 feet when turning off of Alpine Park Avenue down to nine or 10 feet where the pavement effectively ends on both sides and locked gates to keep trespassers and trash dumpers out. Alpine Park property owners beyond these gates are in the process of requesting an official abandonment past these gates with, with our full support. Another owner on my side of the Alpine Park Boulevard near lot four is wanting to subdivide their lot in the same fashion as ours and pursue a similar development, which we also fully support. Uh, as far as the development pattern goes, there's, a, there's several SPs um, one of which can only be directly compared to because it's a, it's a residential SP, uh, about 200 feet south of our property at 3215, 3217, 3219, uh, 3221 Alpine Park Avenue. It's the same concept of ours of two sets of attached duplexes, except their lot is 5,000 square feet smaller than ours. Um, we feel strongly that our proposed project is aligned with the T3NE land use policy, but also that this development pattern is Yes, this development pattern in Bordeaux. Uh, one issue we have, we've reached, since we purchased the property, we reached out to the owner on the other side of lot number three, which is um, 3218 Alpine Park Boulevard. Between us sits a 30 foot wide unimproved street called Robert Street. We, and I've been told other owners have been trying to abandon that street for many years, but no one's been able to get a hold of this owner. And um, I don't know if there's a way without support of both property owners to abandon a street, uh, if that can be done administratively. Um, but that would get us 15 additional foot feet of frontage if it is split evenly. And then this becomes an administrative approval for our subdivision. Uh, the unique shape of our lot should also be considered in granting the exception. Uh, at 92.54, uh, we have a rear boundary that widens out to 136 feet. It's actually wider than that, but adding Goodrich Street uh, narrows it again. Um, so we would have enough road frontage to subdivide our lot into two lots if it was oriented in any other way. Um, let's see. 
The other alternative, if we do not get an exception, would be to construct and, and improve Robert Street, which uh, I don't think anyone wants to do. It would be a road that would only service these four houses since the rest of Goodrich Street has already been abandoned. Um, and Robert Street is now used as a drainage ditch um, that the citizens, it's not, a, it's not on a stormwater map, but the citizens created a stormwater ditch and that's what the street is used for. We think that's the best intent and use of that street. So we would really prefer not to improve that street. Um, the additional evidence and, and photos that I've given you is just a, a preliminary site plan of, of how we would make one cut and use one shared driveway to service the four homes. Um, I think that's just the best use of the topography. I don't know if the pictures or even the, the survey, it's, it's, they are deemed critical lots, both of them, and we'll have to have a couple of extra building precautions. Um, but, I, but I do think that uh, the second page that, that outlines all of the streets that have never been built, I'm kind of, uh, my company also owns lots seven and lots eight, uh, and we've kind of, vowed to, instead of improving that road and widening that road, we've been told by utility Metro Water, namely, that we would ex we would have to extend water and extend sewer if we wanted to build anything more than one house. The square footage in the zoning would create a, a maximum of six houses, but we've told them we're only committed to one house, and that's the way we feel like it should be on that side with the utility situation. Um, I'm going to save... 50 seconds for rebuttal. <laughs> Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, anyone speaking in support? Anyone in opposition? Then I think you have your 50 seconds back if you want them. <laughs> I, think, I think I'm good. Thanks. I, I feel like uh, I was here last time in October. I had a little bit different case with County Hospital Road. There was a 32 feet of road frontage, and I needed 50 on a very, very busy road. And I feel like this series of dead ends is uh, is in fitting for, for the exception at less than four feet. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be happy to kick us off. So, staff, walk us through this Roberts Road that's never been built and how he could go about getting that closed officially and reclaim that width, because then I think this becomes really easy. And I don't think we need to ever build this road. Certainly. So, um... Right-of-way abandonments uh, typically start at NDOT. Um, a property owner can apply. You usually have to have any owner signatures. However, if you aren't able to get all the owner signatures, the council member can still take it forward. If, if all efforts have been made, then a council member could take it forward. Um, it is somewhat easier when it's an unbuilt situation because you're not sort of removing someone's ability to access something. So, and if it was to be abandoned, it would be split sort of evenly down the middle between the two. And so it's a, it's a, it's a process to get it done. Um, and so that would add additional, like you said, additional, um, however much, 15 feet or so, uh, to either property. Um, you all do have, in, if that is a process that they want to go through, that is an option as well. It would just then make it bigger, but you all do have given yourselves the opportunity for exceptions. Um, when you set the minimum width, I don't know if you all recall, it was a couple years ago when you set the minimum width of 40 feet if it was a T4 urban, 50 feet if it was, um, um, yes, yeah, T4 evolving, 50 feet if it was T3 evolving, which this is, um, that, that you wrote in there that you could consider exceptions for sort of unique cir circumstances. Um, and there is less frontage required for permanent dead ends, sort of like acknowledging that the curve of a cul-de-sac where you usually have more pie-shaped. And this was unusual, and we did have conversations internally about it. We sort of determined this isn't really a permanent dead end um, situation, but, you know, we sort of contemplated that. So this is a bit of a unique situation, um, and it is very near to being it. So you all do have the option, even without the abandonment. 
So to the applicant, have you reached out to the council person and NDOT to try to recapture this road that's never been built? No, I, I was under the impression that you need I was under the impression that you needed both property owners' signatures that it would be effect in order to move forward. So that's very good news. Okay. So and I have not. My assumption is if you were to reclaim this abandoned, unbuilt road, that you might shift your site plan slightly towards the road? Possibly, but not not too much because it is being used as a, a drainage ditch, and I would okay. I would like to. So you wouldn't change your site plan, okay? No. So it wouldn't alter. What no, you're it would just build. give us more road frontage, but the site plan would say the same. So uh, I know our subdivision regulations always compare lot frontage, but I do think we have the ability to make exceptions, and in this particular case, given the location of the lot, given the circular nature of sort of the dead end road given the unbuilt abandoned road um i think i'm gonna support an approval of this which would be a disapproval of staff's disapproval <laughs> thank you commissioner clifton well i fully agree with that um i think you've listed out my notes said mentioned there's some unique circumstances and you've listed them <laughs> so you're much better at this than me i mean this is just a classic case of why we have this in here i mean it's just overly technical not to approve this um and it's really a matter for the council and a political matter at this point given everything we've heard as opposed to a planning matter so i'll be very happy to vote for um whatever we're going to do for approval or is that the right word for what we need to be but you're voting for uh, to, to yes, disapprove staff's recommendation. Yeah. yeah. Right. Commissioner Henley. Um, yeah, nothing further to add. I, I'm a big fan of projects like this. I commend you for all the work and analysis you did and bringing it before. So I'm, I'm happy to support it. Councilman Withers. I uh, concur with my previous commissioners uh, to overturn the staff recommendation <laughs> um, just based on the uh, a, lo a lot of evidence of many, many unique circumstances. So thank you. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you. Uh, I, I was contemplating how to uh, interpret this because it's not a cul-de-sac, but if we treat Alpine Park Boulevard as a continuous circular cul-de-sac, we can kind of apply, uh, kind of stretch of the interpretation of the sub-reg, but we can apply that's a continuous uh, cul-de-sac. So for that sense, uh, we could overlook that way. But one thing I would like to uh, kind of um, make sure is, because there are a couple of uh, lots, uh, applicant may want to apply same, uh, you know, subdivision. And so the water pressure and infrastructure, if so, they do have to meet those metro water regulation when they apply, correct? Yes, that's correct. And, and Metro Water Services did recommend approval of this plat with the two lots. Okay. So with that, I will make a motion to disapprove, staff disapprove. So in other words, I will make a motion to approve. And if you could, uh, Commissioner, um, approve with an exception to the frontage requirement. Yes, I will make a motion to approve uh, exception to the frontage requirement due to the unique uh, location of this parcel. Any other discussion? Did we get that right, Lisa? Approve the disapprove. Okay. Uh, and, uh, okay, all in favor? Aye. Okay, motion carries. And I think that that brings us to the end of our items. I uh, want to quickly I'm take sorry. the take a moment to commend the oh. applicant. You did a fantastic job. Thank you. Presenting the facts, even with your handouts. I appreciate that. Let, Thank you. It is an enigma, the top of the Let day. me, I'm sorry. I wanted to make sure um, it should be 
and we may need to reset. It. it should be approved with conditions, including an exception to the frontage requirement, because there were conditions listed if it was approved. So that should be the motion. I don't know if we need to redo that, Tara, but it just needs to include the with conditions and an exception. Uh, let's just do it and clean it up. Make it perfect. Well, let's give it a try. I will make motion to approve with condition with exception of the frontage requirement. Second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. And Commissioner Haynes' message carries. <laughs> okay, so let's see. Um, we are on to historic zoning report. Yes, uh, just a quick update. Uh, I'm so proud to announce we are accepting 47th Annual Preservation Award. And the deadline to recommend the application is February 13th. So, so if you know anybody or any uh, property or anything worthy of a preservation award, uh, please submit the uh, application and recommendation. Thank you very much. Um, Parks? So we are, uh, as Councilman Withers so well knows, we're about to go into budget season. Um, so I will continue to advocate parks is the most underfunded department in the city um, and parks needs money. So as we go into this, send money. Report. Um, executive committee report. I don't think there we have anything to. OK, um, legislative update. I have no report for today, so. Thank you. Everybody's quite succinct. Okay. Well, with that, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. All right. See you all in a couple of weeks. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.